must be done if we are going to prevent a food shortage. That's how important this hearing is. And uh, after, after my opening statement, members will receive testimony from our outstanding witnesses today. And then the hearing will be open for questions. And now before we get to the business today, I'd like to take a moment, yield to our distinguished ranking member, Mr. Thompson, for a very important announcement about our newest member. Well, Chairman, thank you so much. Uh, uh, I'd like to reiterate uh, the Chairman's comments and welcoming Representative uh, Finstead uh, to the House Agriculture Committee. Uh, Brad is the operator of a family farm and has held numerous positions where he's served as a valuable voice for farmers and rural communities, including State Director of USDA for USDA's Rural Development in Minnesota. Executive Director of the Minnesota Turkey Growers Association, Area Director with the Minnesota Farm Bureau, and, and more. And so given his extensive background, his knowledge and experience in agriculture, I can't think of a, another committee that would be better served by, by Brad's presence. So uh, welcome, Brad, and, uh, and we look forward to working with you. And Chairman, I yield back. Very fine. Welcome, Brad. Good to have you with us. Ladies and gentlemen, today our farmers, our ranchers, our foresters are able to use USDA's technical and financial assistance to support a variety of ways to increase soil health. This is what is so important today. Our food comes from the soil. The soil, the earth, is the start of our food supply chain. And that is why we wanted to have this hearing, so we could share the latest information about regenerative farming, what we must do to enrich our soil. That is the way we make sure that we have food security. And I want to just thank so many people who been active in this and been putting it together. And I want to first mention Kiss the Ground, an extraordinary film that opened my eyes to much of what I was only dimly aware. And um, Mr. Finnegan, make peace. What a name, make peace did an extraordinary job. And I'm going to show a small clip of it. Uh, Mr. Fenneman, thank you. You have really opened our eyes to what we need to certainly address. And supply the support that we need for regenerative agriculture. And additionally, I want to uh, mention the exciting work being funded by the Partnerships for Climate Smart Commodities Program that is being led by my good friend, Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack with the USDA. And just this morning, Secretary Vilsack announced funding for $25 million to the outstanding Rodale Institute to be able to work with the University of Georgia and Emory University in my state that I represent here in Congress, Georgia. And it will help our farm producers expand their markets, their produce, while reducing greenhouse gas emissions, educating consumers, and developing technology that will improve sealability of their model. This is so important, and I am so very supportive of what Secretary Vilsack is doing with this program. And this project is one of 70 
receiving funding, and of course, with it being in Georgia, I can assure you that it will be most successful. And um, now I want to share with you this clip. And I want you to see the brilliance, the dynamic message that Kiss the Ground is doing. This is what uh, the, the movement that got me involved uh, with this issue. So I believe our technician is ready to play it. Enjoy and learn. Today we are surrounded by the consequences of degeneration. Turn it Flooding, extreme drought, fires, habitat loss, extreme temperatures. And oh, just a second. We're going to make sure we get the volume up. Mm. But it's not enough. As a farmer, I have hope because the solution is right under our feet. Our soil. Can you go back there and see what's going on? We're going to pause for a moment to get the film ready. Uh, you can imagine what's going on back there. Technology is wonderful when it's working. <laughs> Thank you, ranking member says technology is wonderful when it's working. So give us a moment and we'll get it together. So let's yield to the hmm? Pretty day to photograph. What's that, boss? I said it's. What we're going to do, we do have some technological issues, and we're going to now recognize our distinguished ranking member, uh, Mr. Thompson of Pennsylvania, for his opening statement. And hopefully, technology will come to our rescue. All right, Chairman, thank you so much. I see uh, our newest member uh, transitioned from uh, attending uh, virtually to, to being in person here. So. Once again, uh, uh, Brad, uh, welcome. We're so so honored and pleased to have you on the Agriculture Committee with with your family history of farming and your your service and uh, in so many different ways to the industry, the number one industry in this country, agriculture. And uh, thank you, and uh, glad to have you on the committee. Honored to have you on the committee. We. Uh, uh, Chairman, thank you. Uh, you know, encouraging soil health and responsible conservation practices in agriculture has been central goals and a priority supported by Congress uh, since the 1930s, and certainly a, a priority of mine uh, since coming to Congress. Um, through the Farm Bill, producers and landowners can access a variety of conservation programs and tools to incorporate activities that support a variety of natural resources. Uh, these programs are voluntary, they're incentive-based and locally led, while leading direct, uh, while directly benefiting the producer uh, and, quite frankly, the economy and the environment. Um, uh, these, these tools that we provide are why American farmers are really the climate heroes around the world. Uh, these uh, tools contribute greatly to the conclusion uh, in research that, that uh, it's pretty striking. It talks about if we want to reduce greenhouse gases around the world, and we want to do that on this day of, uh, of September of 2022, all we need to do is for American farmers, ranchers, and foresters to produce more and export it overseas. So farmers and ranchers are the original environmentalists and have adopted proven conservation practices to encourage soil health and other environmental benefits. Uh, producers and landowners are also generating soil health benefits through grazing and active management of forest lands. Science, technology, and innovation have always been important to the success of agriculture, and I would say that is the purest definition of American agriculture. This continues to be true as we build out technologies that improve soil health. For example, biotechnology, the use of crop protection tools, and access to precision ag technology will help deliver soil health and climate benefits in both short and long term. You know, because the investments in agricultural research, the U.S. has become the most efficient agricultural producer in the world. In fact, American farmers, ranchers, and landowners produce 
287% more uh, than in the 1940s, with little to no change in inputs. And I believe uh, that this industry is not static, it's dynamic, and we will continue to provide tools uh, to, uh, the, perhaps we can take that to a 400% uh, increase by 2035. The, uh, now, some want you to believe that regenerative agriculture is somehow revolutionary, and, uh, and it's very positive, but, but soil health has been a fundamental tenet of the Farm Bill conservation programs from their very inception. In the 2018 Farm Bill, we've made improvements to programs like creating a conservation incentive contract that would pave the way for easier adoption of management activities like cover crops. We've also made soil health a major component of the new on-farm conservation innovative trial, innovation trials, and soil health is also central, is a central purpose of the conservation stewardship program. Unfortunately, most of today's panelists do not represent the breadth of conservation movement in the United States, but a small minority that, that wants to redefine regenerative agriculture as only organic, that's, which is just not true. Uh, while, I, and I, while I support farmers who, who, farmers who want to receive a premium through organic agriculture, I think that's a, a wonderful thing. I appreciate the premiums that uh, um, our uh, organic uh, farmers and ranchers uh, uh, are able to, to generate. Um, uh, through organic agriculture. We cannot let the idea permeate that organic is the only way to be a conservation steward. And attacks on industrial agriculture or conventional agriculture are quite frankly are divisive and unhelpful. Now please don't get me wrong, soil health is critically important for American agriculture and rural communities uh, around the nation. I got my first introduction on Shrek Farm in Clinton County, a county I'm picking back up, by the way, looks yeah. like. Uh, a wonderful soil health uh, uh, day that we spent there looking at soil samples and uh, the difference uh, on and the changes uh, that can be facilitated with good, solid agriculture practices. Uh, in fact, I was proud to host and chair uh, actually one of the first soil health hearings in Congress in 2014 as then chairman of the Conservation Energy and Forestry Subcommittee. However, I think it's necessary to make the distinction that organic agriculture production is not the only means of production that promotes and maintains soil health. Uh, that will be largely what we're concentrating hearing today uh, uh, about organic agriculture. And I, su I support an all of the above approach when it comes to soil conservation. We also must ensure USDA's conservation programs remain voluntary locally led and incentive-based, and most importantly, keeps the producer first. You know, the European Union's Farm to Fork Initiative has shown that tying food policy to climate policy is harmful to, harmful to food production and economic viability for all. In fact, the USDA's Economic Research Service found that the e EU will see a production decrease of 12% and prices increase by 17% by 2030 under their Farm to Fork Initiative. Worldwide, we will see a 9% price increase as a result of the EU's adoption. And if there were to be a global adoption of this program worldwide, food prices would increase 89% by 2030. So looking forward, uh, the next farm bill, to the next farm bill, I, I'm not gonna sit idly as, as we let decades of real bipartisan progress be turned on its head to satisfy people who at their core think agriculture is a blight on the landscape. I, I've been leaning into the climate discussion, embracing it, and leading. Um, but I'm not going to have us suddenly incorporate buzzwords like regenerative agriculture into the Farm Bill or, or overemphasize climate within the conservation or research title while undermining the other longstanding environmental benefit that these programs provide. As we begin the Farm Bill process, we cannot allow the promises of organic agriculture, uh, which are many, uh, or climate policy to cause us to lose sight of the many other benefits that our current food system provides under the broad goals of farm conservation. So Chairman, thank you so much. Looking forward to hearing from our witnesses and, and this hearing. I yield back. Well, thank you, Ranking Member, and for your excellent uh, opening statements. And what we're going to do, we're gonna give our hardworking and excellent uh, technicians a little more time to get this film together, so because it is extraordinary. And what I would like to do, while we give them a little more time, is to introduce to you in the committee, 
and those who are watching across the nation, our distinguished lineup of witnesses today. And also, I want uh, to request that other members just submit your opening statements for the record so that we can get our witnesses uh, testimony and ensure that we have ample time for well, everyone's questions. Now, our first witness today is Mr. Jeff Moyer. Mr. Moyer is the Chief Executive so Officer of the Rodell Institute. Hello. Um, someone needs to mute. Yeah. Let's do it that way. Um, and uh, Mr. Jeff Moyer is doing an excellent job at the Rodell Institute. And then uh, certainly a grad congratulations to you for the wonderful financial of $25 million that we are giving to you today to carry on that excellent work. Our next witness is Mr. Steve Nygren. Mr. Nygren is the founder and chief executive officer of the Great Serenby, and he's also one of my constituents Serenby is in the great Chattahoochee Hills in Georgia in our 13th district. You're doing such an outstanding job and you are a national leader in our agriculture industry. Welcome. Our third witness today is Mr. Ken McCarty, who is a partner in the McCarty Family Farms from Goby, Kansas. Welcome. Our fourth witness is Mr. Rick Clark, who is the owner of Farm Green and Clark Land and Cattle, and he is testifying on behalf of Regenerate America. And our fifth and final witness today is Dr. Rebecca Larson, who is the Vice President, Chief Scientist, and Government Affairs for the Western Sugar Cooperative. What a ranking member, what a distinguished group we have today. And now, as I mentioned this film, and you all are about to witness an extraordinary message about the urgency, the need for us to kiss the ground. All right, technicians, we are ready. Thank you, Ashmi. Today, we are surrounded by the consequences of degeneration, flooding, extreme drought, fires, habitat loss, extreme temperatures, and failing crops. We keep trying to sustain what's broken, hear it? but it's not enough. As a farmer, I have hope because the solution is right under our feet, our soil. The journey to regenerative agriculture for me was strictly economic. It was more cost effective for the cows to eat grass than to buy feed. Learning to live within the means of what my farm could provide made a huge impact for us in terms of our local economy because we, we only used local, we use local processors, and then we sold local. We tried our best to sell everything we could in our zip code. Without increasing my sales, I gave myself a raise because I focused on local. We've improved the health of our livestock. We've improved the, the grasses and species and varieties and diversity that we have out in the land. And so it takes less space to feed these animals. But when you add those commas and zeros up, at the end of the year, 
and your banker smiles at you, that's a freaking win. Through this whole process of increasing biodiversity on our farm, we have been able to eliminate insecticides and uh, fungicide applications. So those are no longer part of our, our plan. Um, those have yielded uh, big savings as well. Uh, not only is uh, regenerative agriculture good for the water cycle and good for emissions and good for stopping soil erosion, but it's definitely um, good for our business as well. The conservation stewardship program has been extremely valuable. And we do also use the conservation reserve program as we go into the next stages of reintegrating cows into grazing cycles into our system. Uh, that we will also uh, be implementing the EQUIP program. The conservation plan is huge and EQUIP. EQUIP has been great. The only downfall of the program is the time in which it, we get responses back to the potential client. We took advantage of, of the EQUIP programs both within, within our pastures in converting cropland into pasture land. The education on, on how to do these things, these practices and principles is is vital it's absolutely key so this education piece for everybody it's not just for the farmers but for our city cousins for our government officials for our government agencies for our politicians join us in calling for strong support for regenerative agriculture and the farm bill Thank you, and once again, we apologize for this technical operation, but you got uh, a part of this film. I encourage you to uh, pursue it and see much more. And again, I apologize. Technology sort of interrupted us there. Um, and now what I would like to do is to start with our testimony. And, and as I mentioned, the whole purpose here is to open up this discussion and share with our nation the importance to understanding that the very start of our food supply chain is the earth, and we are losing the vital component of carbon and so we got to do all that we can to make sure we're getting this carbon back in the ground. And this is why we are here. And so uh, our first um, uh, witness today will be Mr. Moyer. Mr. Moyer, you can start when you're ready. Chairman Scott. Ranking Member Thompson, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. The written testimony I provided to the committee expands on the points I'll make here. First, I want to thank you for holding this historic hearing. It's critically important that we focus on the health of America's soil. It's key to solving problems I know you and your constituents are focused on. Members of the committee, if you're looking for an agricultural method that increases farm profitability, is regenerative, better for the environment, and produces healthier food for Americans, then all you need to do is look beneath your feet. Regenerative organic agriculture, which prioritizes soil health, accomplishes all of that. A strong, viable economic model that supports American farmers transitioning to regenerative organic agriculture already exists. And it doesn't matter what kind of tractor a farmer drives or what kind of crops they plant. All farms can benefit from regenerative organic practices. But we need to adopt changes now because America's food system is broken. It's too reliant on unstable foreign supply chains, chemical pesticides, and government subsidies for foods that aren't healthy for our constituents or profitable for America's farming families. And our current agricultural systems are also degrading America's soils. Recent events have shown that this country must begin working toward food independence. Russia's war against Ukraine exposed dangerous cracks and frailties in the global food system and supply chains. However, this is not a doomsday scenario. We have the tools and the time to fix this and set our farms on a positive track and regenerative organic agriculture is our path forward. 
Rodale Institute is the 75-year-old Pennsylvania-based nonprofit research and education institution that I manage. We confront this challenge every day with our staff of PhD scientists and farmers like me who work to create a resilient food system that improves soil health and the economics of farming. So we champion regenerative organic agriculture. That's because it's reliable, resilient, and does not depend on foreign agricultural inputs like Russian-made synthetic fertilizers. Regenerative organic farms use a whole systems approach to grow food that actively restores soil health, which is critical because healthy soil has always been the foundation of successful farming. After all, soil impacts harvests and the long-term viability of any farm. But right now, we're not doing enough to protect our soil. And that's foolish because it's a finite resource key to our survival. Current estimates suggest that by 2050, soil degradation may reduce crop yields up to 10%. But research shows organic farming can reverse soil degradation and actually improve soil health. And that's not its only benefit. Regenerative organic agriculture showcases production strategies that conventional farmers can take advantage of. Like the use of roller crimpers along with cover crops to reduce or eliminate tillage and the need for nitrogen fertilizer. But in order for these practices to be employed at scale, we need to tweak, equip, and crop insurance regulations to incentivize the outcomes we want, not disincentivize them. Rodale Institute has a 40-year-long farming systems trial, the longest of its kind running in this country, where we examine organic agriculture and conventional agriculture side by side in real world contexts. The study's recent findings show that organic systems will be more profitable for farms while improving soil health. Members of the committee, we can make that the standard for this country. More profit for farmers and healthier soil too. Look, it would be a lot easier if we as humans could just eat soil. No one would go to the supermarket or restaurant and ask for soil laced with fungicides, pesticides, and salt-based fertilizer. We'd ask for good organic soil and rich compost. Well, in effect, we do eat soil, or at least the plants we eat do. Let's make it possible for us all to choose a plan that improves our soils, makes farming families more economically secure, and puts America on a path to food independence. Regenerative organic agriculture is how we get there. Thank you for taking time to listen to my testimony today, and I do look forward to your questions. And thank you, Mr. Boyer, for your excellent testimony. And now, Mr. Nigren, you are now recognized for your five minutes, and welcome to our committee. Thank you, Chairman Scott, Ranking Member Thompson, and members of the committee for the honor of addressing you today. My name is Steve Nigren, founder and CEO of Serenby, located in Chattahoochee Hills, Georgia's 13th Congressional District. I want to talk about soil health and how it leads to economic vitality. My written testimony will expand on these points. It starts with the local farm and farmers. The recognition that we need healthy soil should compel us to recognize our American agrarian economy and what drives it, starting with how we inhabit the landscape. We must, produce food we must produce food locally, implement policies and programs that support this local production, and prioritize regenerative organic farming. You are aware of the shrinking number of U.S. farmers and the conversion to industrial agriculture, replacing the local family farm. What we do not talk about is the effect on the local agrarian economy. Industrial ag dollars do not support the local bank the local hardware store, or the main street merchants in the same way that local farmers do. Rural America has been stripped of its identity and economic stability. We're now feeling some of the negative results of this drastic shift and consolidation. The good news is there has been a renewed interest in local farms, markets, and foods that continues to accelerate. 
The pandemic has also placed a spotlight on food production, the increased health issues our country faces, and how people are dramatically reassessing where they live and what they eat. In 1950, Georgia produced 80% of the food consumed in the state. Today, it is a fraction of that amount. We are consuming products imported from around the world and eating food grown on U.S. soil with detrimental chemicals based on relationships with foreign governments. This increased dependence on a global supply chain for our food can make the difficulties of the pandemic seem mild should there be a disruption in our global industrial food system. I grew up on a generational farm in Colorado. Following college, I became a hospitality entrepreneur. For those of you who worked on the Hill in the 80s and early 90s, you might remember the peasant on Pennsylvania. During this period, I bought a historic farm just outside Atlanta in an area that would later become Chairman Scott's district, enabling my young children to experience in a small way the rural life I had grown up with. Recognizing the need for investments in local community and our farmlands, in 2000, I drove an effort to save the rural landscape we had come to love with 500 local neighbors. We formed a, a county overlay for 40,000 acres, saving 70% of the land for agriculture. We passed historic legislation for Georgia and in 2004 broke ground on Serenby, a community model of balanced growth with working organic farm at its center. Serenby is an example of how agriculture can be incorporated within developments as a financial and lifestyle advantage. For $34 a week, 75 families receive a farm share that includes their produce for the week. Hundreds more are reached through our farmer's market and local restaurants. And to combat food waste, our farm has opened the first citywide compost station. Serenby stands as a model of the agrihood movement. I may have built a town, but Will Harris of White Oak Pastures has saved one. Bluffton, Georgia has gone from a ghost town to a destination in one decade. His transition to regenerative cattle farming now employs 180 people with more than $100,000 in weekly payroll. White Oak is the largest private employer in the county, restoring an economy and changing the lives of one small rural community. Today, we need programs in place to support and promote the growing market for locally produced food grown in chemical-free soil. Small farms and regenerative organic farmers need an equal opportunity. They need supportive policies, designated dollars, that will reach the hardworking farmers in the fields, such as many, such as Matthew Rayford, who's with us today. Think of soil health as a platform to bring our small towns back to life. When farming and soil is rescued, then many other businesses and value-added productions will follow. Soil health is imperative to American health. Through the Farm Bill and the direct actions of this committee, you can affect real change for our farmers, our food systems, our economy, and our communities. I urge you to find, fund organizations that will directly impact small and historically marginalized farmers working to produce regenerative organic foods. Thank you for your time. And thank you, Mr. Nigrant, for your excellent testimony. And now, Mr. McCarty, please begin when you're ready. Good morning, Chairman Scott, Ranking Member Thompson, members of the committee. Thank you for allowing me to join the conversation today as you prepare for the upcoming Farm Bill. I'm Ken McCarty, and I look forward to discussing what regenerative agriculture means to McCarty family farms. My three brothers and I are fourth generation dairy farmers originally from a small farm in Bradford County, Pennsylvania, where my family farmed for more than 100 years. In the late 90s, my parents began searching for opportunities that would allow my brothers and I to continue our family's farm. Eventually, that led us to Rexford, Kansas, where we have gradually grown our business to include five dairies. Three dairies in Northwest Kansas, one in Southwest Nebraska, and most recently a partnership dairy with another fourth generation family farm in Mercer County, Ohio. We also own and operate a milk condensing plant at the Rexford Farm that reduces the freight to move our finished products by 75% while reclaiming 65,000 gallons of fresh water every day. We are currently in the process of building a state-of-the-art dairy farm near the original Rexford Dairy and expanding the processing capacity of the milk plant. 
Continually improving our farm management and implementing sustainable farming practices is key to the success and growth of our business. Every day, we strive to create wholesome dairy foods in a responsible and sustainable manner. And we are deeply committed to regenerative ag practices and have been recognized as a leader in that space. For example, McCarty Family Farms is Validus Dairy Care certified, farm program verified, and our certified B Corp. And for the past two years, we've been recognized as a best for the world B Corp in the environmental impact area. We've also received multiple awards from the U.S. Dairy Innovation Center, National Milk Producers Federation, IDFA, the state of Kansas, and others. Also, since 2016, we have worked annually with sustainable environmental consultants to evaluate and verify our ecosystem impact, which is reported publicly on our website. This approach to transparency and third-party validation helps us market our milk and creates a foundation for sustainable business growth. As an example, we sell most of our milk to Danone North America, another certified B Corp and a leading global food and beverage company who processes our milk into products such as Danon, Oikos, Activia, and Light and Fit yogurts. Regenerative agriculture may be a buzzword for some, but for McCarty Family Farms, it is a holistic mindset that encourages us to consider a multitude of practices across our farms, especially those associated with core values like soil health, resource conservation, animal welfare, and the welfare of our team members, families, and communities. Practices such as cover crops, reduced tillage, improved nutrient management, and excellent animal care practices under one coherent vision can optimize the performance and sustainability of our farms. In general, regenerative agriculture should provide measurable economic, social, and environmental benefits that help improve rather than just sustain our ecosystems. And we've been able to demonstrate just that. For example, water conservation technologies have helped to save millions of gallons of fresh water every year while reducing our input costs. Enhancements to animal welfare have helped ensure more milk production with fewer resources consumed. For McCarty Family Farms and our partners, regenerative agri agriculture must move beyond a qualitative concept towards making decisions based on quantitative outcomes. By benchmarking and tracking our environmental and economic performance, we can better understand the impacts and make better di business decisions. In general, these regenerative efforts have helped demonstrate that dairy farming and all of agriculture can be a part of the solution for our climate and our economy, while of course helping to feed the world. At times, USDA programs are helpful to incentivize new ideas and reduce upfront costs when a clear short-term ROI isn't possible. And while we know regenerative practices produce economic benefits in the long term, such as increased efficiency and resilient yields and improved market opportunities, upfront costs can still be a barrier to implementation. Traditional ag lending looks year to year, while regenerative, regenerative agriculture takes a longer term view, which is why conservation funding and incentives are crucial to greater adoption. When considering USDA conservation programs, budgets are just one barrier to greater adoption. Challenges such as equip backlogs, rigid contract structures, cumbersome applications, and burdensome follow-up reporting create additional strain. We work with our partners, including Danone, to explore different financing and incentive models. USDA programs such as the Conservation Innovation Grant for on-farm trials allowed us to work with non-federal partners such as Danone, Sustainable Environmental Consultants, and National Fish and Wildlife Foundation to finance scalable regenerative management. By considering the applications and contract costs to farmers and allowing farmers to work with familiar partners rather than just USDA alone, I believe programs can support more farms investing in regenerative agriculture. We need a simpler, more streamlined process to engage with USDA and other stakeholders to implement a wider variety of regenerative innovations. Thank you for the time today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. McCarty, for your excellent uh, testimony. And now, Mr. Clark, please begin when you're ready. Chairman Scott, Ranking Member Thompson, members of the committee, thank you for having me here today. I am absolutely honored. My name is Rick Clark. I'm a fifth generation farmer from West Central Indiana, and we farm about 7,000 acres of row crops. Folks, this is urgent and it's critical that we have bipartisan action on the topic at hand today. I am a Republican, and I've spoken to thousands of farmers across this country, and not once has my party affiliation come up. The witnesses here today do not represent the diversity of virginity farmers and ranchers. We are especially missing voices of indigenous leaders and farmers of color. And it is critical in this farming journey that you have the support of your family. And I'm gonna tell you, they have my back. 
American farmers are the most productive in the world, but we have to acknowledge the condition our soils are in. We are in trouble. 5.6 tons per acre per year of soil are leaving our fields. I am not here today to offend the practices of any farmer, and we have to understand the heritage and history they have. We also need to understand our soil is fragile and degrading right in front of our eyes, which leads me to why I'm here today. Adopting soil health practices can slow down and reverse the degradation of soil. I want to leave you today with the confidence that regenerative agriculture can be incorporated into any farming operation and be far better for your bottom line. After decades of heavy tillage on our farm, a one inch rain event created so much erosion on our farm, I knew it was time to do something different. Like thousands of farmers, I started cover cropping through Equip. This is an essential program to increase farmers' comfort level of change. In my written testimony, there is a photo of my soil and my neighbor's soil just 20 feet apart from each other. The difference is astounding. My soils have water infiltration rates of 20 inches per hour, and the neighbors have an infiltration rate of one half inch of rain per hour. Our soils have 1.5 million earthworms per acre. The neighbor's farms have nearly zero earthworms. So how do we get there? We need to follow the six principles of soil health. One, context, this is key. While practices change from Texas to Indiana, Principles are universal. Two, minimize disturbance. Three, maximize diversity. Four, living roots. Five, armor the soil. Six, animal integration. A little bit more about our operation. We have not used starter fertilizer, seed treatments, fungicides, insecticides, pesticides, phosphorus, or potassium in eight years. And to boot, we're organic with no tillage. I am far down this path, but any farm can start and experience incredible results with ecologically and economically, especially with proper education and support. And note, it doesn't have to be organic. Cover crops are doing more than protecting and building soil. Our operation uh, cover crops have become an offensive juggernaut with cereal rye giving us upwards of $435 per acre worth of N, P, and K, and legume cover crops giving us upwards of $969 worth of value when terminated with a roller crimper at maturity. Most farmers can't achieve this without tools, education, and changes to crop insurance rules that require termination well before maturity. Our farm, on our farm, we have currently reduced diesel fuel consumption by 50%, chemistry and fertility by 100%, and based on regional input spending averages, we are saving $1,957,000 annually. Lastly, our farm is more resilient against flood and drought. We are more resilient to supply disruptions, and we have a systematic approach that will be economically profitable and viable for generations to come. We need to help American farmers integrate cover crops into their operation within their context. We need to also help American ranchers adopt regenerative grazing practices. On behalf of Reg Regenerate America Coalition, we are pushing to ensure the next farm bill robustly supports regenerative ag. We need better education and technical assistance, equitable opportunities and access, infrastructure and processing, healthy and regionally sourced food, farmland preservation, incentives for soil health and risk mitigation. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak today. I look forward to future hearings and conversations with each of you. Thank you. Excellent testimonies. We are getting here today, right on target. Thank you. And now, Dr. Larson, you are now recognized for your five minutes. Chairman Scott, Ranking Member Thompson, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me here today. I have a PhD in plant science and 22 years of diverse experience with sugar beets. I work for 800 small family farmer owners of Western Sugar Cooperative. We have a 100-year history that spans 110,000 acres across Colorado, Nebraska, Wyoming, and Montana. 
I help measure the environmental impact of our farmers' practices and guide their investment in public research. Included with my written testimony is the data substantiating our gains our farmers have made in soil health and regenerative agriculture. Soil health is critical for farmers. It reduces crop inputs, increases crop productivity, and instills resiliency in the agroecosystem. The USDA recognizes four soil health principles, minimize soil disturbance, keep soil covered, maintain living roots, and employ diverse crop rotation. Tillage, mechanical working of the soil, works against three of those principles and is arguably the biggest threat to soil health. I am here to provide concrete examples from our cooperative and national trends that demonstrate conventional farming has made significant gains in soil health. Since the 1950s, modern agriculture has enabled exponential adoption of conservation tillage across the U.S. Today, a majority of conventionally produced U.S. commodity crops use conservation tillage. One out of every five is no-till. Clearly, farmers value soil health, as a third of conservation tillage was adopted with zero outside incentive. I see similar trends for sugar beets. 82% of Western sugar growers use conservation tillage, which has tangibly improved soil health and imparted other dramatic environmental benefits. At the same time, our yield has climbed from 8,000 to more than 11,000 pounds of sugar per acre. This is true sustainable intensification. Conventional agriculture paved the way with conservation tillage. More recently, no-till organic cropping has emerged. However, most organic systems still rely on tillage, especially row crops, small grains, and vegetable crops. For both conventional and organic farms, adoption of conservation tillage is highly dependent on soil type, climate, scale, and cropping system. Ultimately, for Western sugar farmers, the adoption of genetically engineered sugar beets with glyphosate tolerance has allowed for widespread elimination of plowing and conversion to conservation tillage. Some claim pesticides are harmful to soil health. We have not found that to be true. Our farm measurement across Western sugar shows microbial diversity and function is up six-fold following the adoption of conservation tillage, despite judicious use of pesticides. The data suggests tillage is far more detrimental to soil health than pesticides. Despite that, in the last decade and a half, Western sugar farmers have cut the quantity of pesticides applied by 40% and reduced the overall environmental impact by 92%, similar to national trends across conventional farming. Technology on the horizon will further reduce reliance on pesticides in the future. However, mandates against pesticides today will hurt not help the climate smart agenda, most critically in the areas of food waste and land conversion. Cover crops also promote soil health. Most closely associated with organic farming, it is also used in conventional systems across the United States. Implementation varies by region and cropping system, as does method of cover crop termination. Western sugar farmers use cover crops under a variety of circumstances. However, our primary soil armor is a residue left from the previous crop, which also serves to promote soil health, as we integrate in livestock for managed grazing, further building soil health. Conservation crop rotation is also key to soil health. All Western sugar growers rotate a diverse range of crops, including the occasional perennials. These rotations include high residue and low nitrogen demand crops that balance nutrient demands and protect the biodiversity that's important to crop health. The evolution of conventional ag practices has reduced soil erosion by 35% across the United States. It is important to recognize that the U.S. is currently a leader in climate smart ag, and farmers are accepting of further improvement. Innovations in modern conventional agriculture are primed to achieve, achieve climate smart goals. Programs authorized by this committee, like SIG, the Sustainable Ag Research and Education Program, and EQIP have been highly effective in helping growers adopt climate smart practices. Western Sugar has used these programs to improve nutrient stewardship and implement high carbon soil amendment to regenerate soil health. As you turn your attention to drafting the next farm bill, I encourage you to continue to support programs like these and invest in outcomes-based solutions that keep the farmer in the driver's seat as they understand the nuance in their production system. It's also imperative to bolster research for agricultural outcomes to enable our next step change in farming. In summary, conventional farming has employed conservation practices like tillage, cover, reduced tillage, cover cropping, and diverse rotations and are continuing to innovate. Thank you for the time today, and I look forward to taking questions. And thank you for your excellent testimony, and all of you, powerful. And this is why we're having 
this hearing. Now, at this time, members will be recognized for questions in order of seniority, alternating between majority and minority members. You, each of you will be recognized for five minutes to get your questions in. And please, as always, keep your microphones muted until you are recognized so that we can eliminate background noise. And now I recognize myself for five minutes. First of all, you all were just brilliant in helping to confirm our great need here. And this great need is what I refer to as a Paul Revere moment. It might not be the British that are coming, but if we do not listen to you and what you are saying about the urgency of regenerative farming, dealing with the source of our food, which is the soil, we will have a food shortage in this country. And I want to start with you, Steve, uh, Mr. Nigrin, my friend. You, you mentioned the status of us in the world. You mentioned also the status of us in our rural communities. And I tell people all the time, you love the milk, you love the beef, but it's in our rural communities which must grow the vegetation, the soil enrichment, which feeds our animal stocks. Tell us the shape that we're in right now and your level of concern about our food security in this nation if we don't move forthrightly on what you've suggested. Thank you, Chairman. Having grown up on a farm in the 40s and 50s, and then moving to Georgia, in both states I've seen the rural communities uh, become, go from vital centers and economic centers to places that are many times ghost towns with many people having to change careers. I have 18 first cousins. Uh, they have all left the industry except for three and they are larger farmers today. Um, we, the idea of our food system is not only going to affect what we eat, but the very economic fiber of this country. And I think some of the things that you see that have happened in, in rural America uh, is an example of the changing systems that we've had. Uh, as you've heard today, there are solutions that will both give us better food and an economic foundation for our rural areas. And the Farm Bill can really change that. Thank you. And Mr. Moyer, you're doing a wonderful job at Rodell. Tell us about your work there. And do you agree with me, if we fail to move on this, we could be facing a food shortage? Please. Th thank you for the question, Chairman Scott. Yes, of, of course, it's critical that we move rapidly to make adjustments to allow farmers to express their desire to improve the health of their soil. Regenerative agriculture, regenerative organic agriculture is all part of a journey. And we're not suggesting that conventional agriculture or conventional farming has not made great advances since the 1950s, but we also have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. The concept that we simply want to sustain a current system or current set of practices to maintain what we have is not adequate. We really need to move forward rapidly with the concept of regenerating the health of our soil to build up earthworm populations, as Mr. Scott already told us about, between his farm and his neighbors. We can do that. Again, we have the tools, we have the time, we have the ability, we need support from uh, members of this committee and from uh, policymakers in order to uh, 
just tweak some of the programs that we have uh, to allow farmers to make the decisions on their landscapes to improve the health of their soil. Thank you. And Mr. Clark, I want to get to your salient points because I believe you're right on target here. What will happen if we do not regenerate our soil? Where will we be in a world where we have to depend upon Russia for our food? We're already depending upon Russia for 66%. They control 66% of the world's fertilizer. Yes. Chairman Scott, thank you for the question. Yes, uh, we have gone down this journey and uh, we have uh, weaned ourselves off of these inputs and we have become more resilient, uh, less, uh, uh, less negativity toward uh, stability or instability within the world. And yes, we need to preserve our soil because that is going to be the future of, of the farming industry. Thank you. And now I recognize the distinguished gentleman from Pennsylvania, our outstanding ranking member, Thompson, for your five minutes. Uh, Chairman, thank you so much. Uh, appreciate your leadership. Appreciate, uh, you know, uh, it's just a pleasure to work with you on something we're both very passionate about, Same agriculture. Um, you know, the, uh, some of the numbers, that, well, I referenced a number that uh, our Productivity has increased 278% since the 1940s. You know, uh, just a couple months ago, <laughs> we were 287%. So the differential is not a, an erosion of soil health. Uh, so, and I think we all acknowledge that. There are other factors that go into productivity, and productivity is important. We're providing so much more food and fiber and building material and energy resources on our on uh, on the lands I used to call rural America, I call them essential America today because they're essential to every American family, uh, what, uh, what we produce. Um, but the factors are, quite frankly, it's been the inflation. It's been uh, the, uh, the elimination of crop protection tools. It's been the fertilizer that has not been available. That is what has uh, impacted uh, and put us at risk of being able to provide all the food that needs to be produced at, at this point. That's a 9% reduction. Those things are all fixable. They're just bad policy that's come out of, out of Washington. Uh, I've had a chance to travel around as ranking member to a lot of different states. I uh, talked with a lot of different farmers and uh, uh, ranchers, foresters, and just people in, in, uh, in Central America. Uh, in my home state of Pennsylvania, which is one of the top 10 cover crop states, <coughs> excuse me, in the United States, there's been a 33% increase in cover crop use since 2012, which is outstanding. Now, again, this is an industry that's, that's not static, it's dynamic, and we can de do even better. And I think we're all dedicated to that. Um, uh, the, uh, and that, that data came from the 2017 USDA Census of Agriculture. However, in my travels to almost 40 states over the past 19 months, I've seen that cover crops are not economic or applicable across all farmlands, which is why the hearing today are so important. Um, I've been in states, uh, specifically was in Texas uh, with the dry conditions. Um, you know, if they put a cover crop in, it's going to suck every bit of moisture out of the ground and whatever crop uh, that they're looking to produce will not flourish, uh, will not grow, um, certainly will not produce a significant yield. So Dr. Larson, do you agree that we, we have to make all, we have to make available all the tools in the toolbox and that prescribing or endorsing certain practices or systems like regenerative organic agriculture, I was in a silo, you know, alone, you know, could stifle research technology and innovation of future practices? Absolutely. There's no scientific consensus on the best practice to farm because there's too much nuance in farming. Yeah. So when you look at the Rocky Mountain West, you mentioned that it would suck all the water out of the ground. So our, our growers use cover crops very judiciously. So after they dig, dig their sugar beets out of the ground, the ground could be left bare. Instead, they often opt to plant a subsequent ca uh, cash crop, like winter wheat, if they can get in there early enough. Otherwise, if they get in late, they'll plant something like rye to keep the ground covered. We have a lot of money that we're investing at both the U University of Wyoming and Montana State to be able to create cover crops for weed management in the spring as well. 
well and explore additional options. But ultimately, if we didn't have access to adequate technology, such as herbicides to control a broadleaf weed and a broadleaf crop, we'd be in big trouble and wouldn't be able to implement the conservation tillage that we have today. Yeah, a lot of diversity. It's uh, agriculture, American agriculture's well, uh, that's something I think all the members of this committee are very passionate about, but it's, uh, it, it, and there's a lot of similarities, right? When you walk from one farm to another, different parts of the country, but there's differences too, in climate, soil types, and uh, weather patterns, and and uh, so it, it really is, uh, you know, there's no single tool. Uh, we have to use every tool in the toolbox. Ms. McCarty, it's nice to meet somebody who uh, whose family originate, uh, uh, or, um originated in, uh, um, next to my district anyway, it's Bradford County. Uh, I'm in McKean County right next door. That's one of my, one of my counties. Uh, you know, Pennsylvania, you know, uh, and, and I, I get it. You all, the size of your farms. I guess first question, Mr. McCarty, is uh, how many dairy cows does your uh, family farms have altogether? Uh, so in total today, across the five dairies, we milk uh, about 13,000 cows. And once our expansion is done, we'll be close to 19,000 milking cows. That's pretty impressive. Uh, knowing Bradford County, actually I have family in Bradford County, I'm guessing that you were in the average uh, statistics uh, where uh, in Pennsylvania where, our, where dairy is our number one agriculture commodity of our largest industry, agriculture, um, and there and there are 5,200 dairies, and the average herd size is 91. So that's quite a uh, – the uh, geography, I think, makes a difference for you all with the states and where you've moved to. Um, and I, so let me just finish up by, you know, making the point, uh, you know, small farmers can't always take on the risks that large farms can when adapting new practices. And I certainly don't want to be the person who walks on to – one of their farms and tells them the federal government mandates that they upend their economic viability of their operations and livelihoods for the sake of climate change, especially when they uh, when they aren't the bad actors in the first place. Uh, so one of the things that I, I know, and that I think the chairman's committed to this, we're we're looking at how do we you know how do we how do we protect the small farmer and specifically dairy, like small dairy farmers in my district and the small producers across the United States who can't afford always the risk um, that um, uh, that that they would uh, that someone like uh, with an economy of scale like your family has taken on. So, Chairman, I know my time is well expired. Appreciate your patience today. Oh, my pleasure. And the point you made about our dairy farmers. Uh, they've informed me that now, right now, we're losing a dairy farmer every single day. That's 365 this year and next year. So you've hit upon a very important thing, and of course, we're addressing that along with our beef cattle, where we're losing 17,000 small beef cattle ranchers every year. When you put that together with our hesitancy to move forthrightly on our soil erosion, we've got a burgeoning crisis. That's why we're here. Thank you for your excellent remarks. And now we will hear from the gentlewoman from Connecticut. Mrs. Hayes, who is also the chair lady of the Subcommittee on Nutrition, Oversight, and Department Operations. Ms. Hayes, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My district is a growing leader in climate smart agriculture. Our producers use eco-friendly practices like cover crops to run their small diversified farms. Last month, I hosted a roundtable in my district with U.S. Deputy Under with U.S. Deputy Secretary Dr. Jewel Brano. Farmers there stressed how committed they were to expanding their regenerative agricultural practices. Unfortunately, as many of you know, this can be expensive and risky. This is especially true for the small farmers and new and, be and, new and beginning farmers that I represent in Connecticut's fifth district. As this Congress continues to make critical investments to, mitig to mitigate climate change, I'm hoping that our witnesses can provide testimony that gives us solutions to help farms of all sizes. Mr. Moyer, you talked about um, soil health quite extensively. Can you talk about, can you 
Tell me a little bit about how improved soil health can protect farmers against increased drought and flooding, because that's what we're hearing a lot about in my state of Connecticut. Certainly, and thank you for the question. There's certain things we can do with soil health and certain things we can't. We can't change the weather. We can't change weather patterns. We can't change the impact of climate change. What we can do is change the soil's ability to interact with weather. So we can, as you heard from, from other te uh, testimony here this morning, we can change the soil's ability to hold and retain water. So while we heard Western states, uh, they say it's too dry to grow cover crops, we have many farmers in Western states that say it's too dry not to grow cover crops. We can grow cover crops, hold moisture in the plant. Cover crops is a term, but it doesn't really clearly spell out all the varieties of crops that we can grow as cover crops. There are hundreds and hundreds of different species of crops we can grow that all serve different purposes. So while we say cover crops as one word, there's many different tools that we can use. So we're suggesting that farms have the ability through changes in tweaks in our equip and crop insurance legislation in the Farm Bill that will allow farmers to make those decisions on their own farm, whether they're conventional or organic, to try to improve the health of their soil and improve their ability to interact with changing weather patterns to build resiliency and sustainability into their uh, production models. Thank you. I appreciate that and look forward to getting more information. I can tell you every news station in my home state last week was running stories about drought and showing just the devastation to small farmers. And, and what it means. So I think you're, we can't change weather patterns, so we need to really be proactive in solutions to how do we engage differently in these environments. Uh, Mr. Clark, you talked about uh, your family's farm switching to regener regenerative agricultural practices. Yes. Can you talk to us about some of the positive changes you saw in the first few years after those switches? Right, thank you for the question, Representative Hayes, thank you. Uh, yes, when, when we started this journey several years ago, we were, we were actually at a point where I was having discussions with my wife. I'm not sure we're going to be able to afford to plant corn and beans anymore. We've got to do something different. So the first immediate thing that we saw was the simple fact that the soil came to, came to life you could see it change right in front of your eyes. We have aggregate stability now that's, that's eight inches deep. We have uh, in water infiltration rates of 20 inches an hour. We have uh, water holding capacity. Uh, we, we, we are sequestering carbon. All of these things we're doing, and you can see a lot of these changes with very simple tests. You can, you can have a, a hammer, a ring, a couple of, of tubes full of water, and you can show soil health every single day. So the immediate thing that we saw was just the breath of fresh air that we're now able to expand and, and grow vertically and not just be tied to a corn and soybean type rotation. Thank you, that um, very important information. Mr. Nigren, the Working Farms Fund at the Conservation Fund has helped 33 farmers secure land in the past few years. How can we better engage to expand those programs so that more farmers can access them and have help with conservation on the ground? I believe make sure that the money is going to organizations that do not have large overheads so that it's hitting the farmers actually in the fields. Uh, and there are many uh, organizations that uh, are connected directly with the small farmers. And I think we need to be aware uh, of those programs and how the money is uh, distributed. Thank you. Right on time. Mr. Chair, right. I yield back. Good job. And now the gentleman from California, Mr. LaMalfa, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Larson, um, you're a, a beet grower or cover that in uh, Colorado, and I've heard some really positive things with some of the methods that you've been able to utilize there. Um, a lot of it uh, gearing around no-till. You know, tillage is, uh, is uh, being looked down upon more and more these days, but um, that might apply well for beets and other crops. But uh, do you see that uh, the, there's other crop types that um, can be readily converted to no-till that, um, you know, I mean, is this, is this supposed to be a one-size-fits-all for all crops to be converted to no-till? 
It's absolutely not one size fits all. Um, as I mentioned, controlling broadleaf weeds in a broadleaf crop, thanks to genetically engineered sugar beets with glyphosate tolerance, was a game changer for us. If you can control the weeds, you don't need to use mechanical removal or tillage to get rid of them. So there are a lot of crops like ours that are difficult to control weeds in that require some alternative method to control them. And often, farmers rely on tillage. Overwhelmingly, organic and conventional farmers rely on tillage. Certainly. Okay. So uh, when, when you talked about the, the beets, you've had to have used genetically modified so that you can use different types of pesticides? Yes. To use a specific herbicide that helps control the weeds more consistently and completely. Uh, did you see any uh, market reverberations for switching to gen gen genetically modified uh, seeds? No, we did not. Okay. All right. Uh, Mr. Moyer, you mentioned in the testimony that... Uh, America's food system is broken and that uh, conventional ag models are degrading farmland. Now, way back in the 30s in the Dust Bowl, even before that, but um, the, the federal government set on a path to try and do things to conserve soil because we saw some terrible outcomes from, uh, from weather and such affecting soil. So much work has been done over the years before this concept of doing things to conserve soil, not lose, lose it to erosion, things of that nature. So um, we've, we've seen tremendous gains made in uh, um, crop yield and um, you know, less labor being required for agriculture in this country. It's, it used to be 50%, now it's less than 1% of, of uh, people work in agriculture these days, it seems. So uh, labor's declined, land use has declined in, in order to get increased crop yields. So. Um, one thing I found in strong agreement with you on is the reliance on international food, food supply is really going to be dangerous for all of us. We see Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The world's going to be in a bad way. With that, um, India and Hungary have decided they're not going to support grain this year. And so we're going to have a real 2023 food supply issue. So um, as well as the gas and fertilizer uh, needs that we have to produce fertilizer, natural gas. So... Um, Sri Lanka has tried to go against using uh, fertilizer and such, and their economy is collapsing. The Netherlands, they're, they're, the Dutch dairy farmers, are in all-out protest over that. And we see Canada, our, our friendly neighbors in the north, go in that direction, too. Um, but the Netherlands will close 11,000 farms and affect over 17,000 farmers. So if our government were to enact similar measures, getting rid of nitrogen and all these things, uh, would have a catastrophic effect on the U.S. food supply and also the world. So the suggestion to reapproach farming as regenerative organic seems to be counterintuitive to part of the testimony. So how is it when we have a global food shortage that when we're talking about these alternative forms of farming and we're going to have end up with less food, less crop grown, or we're converting to cover crops, or we're going to have lower yield with um, regenerative organic, as you term it, how is that going to work in a, in a world that's already uh, going to see perilous uh, food shortages, as even promised by President Biden? Well, I, I think there's a, uh, thank you for the question, uh, Congressman. I think there's a whole lot of issues that you uh, stated that need to be unpacked. It's not as simple as saying uh, organic or regenerative organic food production has lower yields. That's not true. Our science and our research indicates that we can match or in many cases during drought or when it's either too wet or too dry, our regenerative organic yields surpass those of conventional farming. I farm, sir. I farm rice. My family's been doing it since 31, and my cousin's since 13. Yeah. When you farm organic rice, you lose yield, and it costs a lot more. So which one-third of the people aren't going to get food? So I'm suggesting that a lot more research needs to be done in the area of regenerative organic agriculture to show how we can sustain yields that are equal or greater than conventional yields. It's not all about, we're sacrificing short-term yield for long-term stability in our soil. And yes, while we have reduced erosion over the years, we're down to a national average of six ton per acre, which is not something we can sustain. 
there's many different forms of soil degradation. Erosion is just one of them. Uh, uh, nutritional quality and nutritional content of the soil is another. Microbial bacteria, uh, biological activity is another. Uh, we have lost over 50% of the soil's uh, fungal capacity to, to uh, maintain the integrity of a, of a uh, phytonutrient called ergothionine. Ergothionine is a health, uh, has health impacts on our society. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Yet on the whole, yields are, have been increasing and more production has been coming out of the land. Now we need to do things to conserve soil and keep going that direction, but a one-size-fits-all, if government ends up because of this climate change situation forcing this on farmers, we're going to be in a bad way in this country the, as, we, as our people and others around the world look to us. Unfortunately, the... I appreciate, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. And I appreciate your line of questioning. You hit the nail on the head. This is exactly why we're here to avoid a food shortage in our nation. Thank you for your questions. And now the gentlewoman from Ohio, Ms. Brown, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Scott and Ranking Member Thompson for holding this hearing today. And um, thank you to our expert panel for being here. Your perspectives are helpful as we look ahead to the next Farm Bill. Unlike organic agriculture, which must meet federal standards and are subject to inspections, regenerative agriculture lacks a clear scientific definition, and it's currently not governed by any USDA standard. So my question is for Mr. Clark, but I welcome others to jump in if they have thoughts as well. Um, Mr. Clark, should USDA clarify and set standards as to what it means to label something regenerative? regenerative? Yes, um, and, and thank you for the question, Representative Brown, and you are exactly correct. There is not a standard definition of regenerative ag. Uh, I'm not saying today that we, we need one, but if we do work toward that goal, let's keep it simple, something like uh, incorporate, incorporating agricultural practices that continue to build soil health. That's pretty simple. And yes, I think that 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 type of nomenclature or, or um, designation needs to be on the food that is available for the consumer, yes. Any other? I would like to comment on that too, if I may please. I think it's very dangerous to try and come up with a blanket statement or a blanket label for one particular type of practice because there's so much nuance in it that requires physical measurement of the impact of the practices that you're implementing. One of the studies cited by Mr. Moyer gave an example of erosion differences between different cultivation practices, and it showed that conventional no-till had far superior erosion prevention capability than the best management practices within organic. So we want to be very careful about trying to say one particular type of production practice should have the label of regenerative and rather focus on measuring the physical outcomes that we all desire to have to mitigate climate change. Thank you. Thank you all. It, it seems to me that further clarity can also help consumers understand what it means when they see a product at the grocery store with the words farmer, farmed using regenerative techniques. So um, I appreciate your responses. Uh, Mr. Clark, in your testimony, you um, also talked about the demand and for scaling up regenerative agriculture practices. As we look to the next Farm Bill, what can we as Congress and the USDA do to be supportive of these efforts? Yeah, did, I'm sorry, did you say scaling up? Is that what you said? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, what we need to do is we have to start with the education process. We have to make sure that the teachers are in place. I think it is absolutely imperative that that when a farmer goes down this road of change and they're so unfamiliar with this, they need the guidance, the support to help make the very first time they try this to be successful. Because I'm afraid if they do not have success, they will not come back. Believe me, I've heard every excuse. I live too far north. It's too cold. Growing season's too short. I've heard them all. So we need to take those excuses away that, that help build that confidence within that farmer. So within answering your question, we need to make sure the six principles of soil health are implemented and that they then are put on a, a system that monitors the progress, teaching and support group is so critical here. Thank you. 
Thank you. And this, um, if you could just go over those six points again very quickly. Sure. Um, you need to, um, uh, it's context. It is um, uh, diversity, a living root, armor the soil, uh, uh, integrate livestock, and I am, I'm, minimize and minimize disturbance. That's my number one. Thank you. Minimize <laughs> disturbance. So those are the, those are the six. Okay, thank you so much for reminding us and thank you for your um, comments. Thank um, Mr. You. Cha Chairman, with that, I yield back. And now the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Baird, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, ranking member. I really appreciate uh, having this conversation. And um, I always appreciate the witnesses taking the time to share their background and ideas with with the committee so we can have a better idea of some of the issues that we have in the Farm Bill. But my first question goes to Dr. Larson, uh, it, and it has to do with uh, the idea that others on the panel have claimed that organically produced food is more nutritious uh, because the soil in their system is, is healthier. Uh, what does the science say about that? Any thoughts there? Yes, thank you for the question. I'm happy to provide uh, copious amounts of scientific research from peer-reviewed journals that shows that there's no correlation between soil health and nutrition within a plant. I can also show you that there's no scientifically credible evidence that suggests that food grown through organic practices is safer or more nutritious than food grown with conventional ag. Um, just to give a couple of examples of where some of that fear-based marketing can have negative effects, especially for marginalized and low-income communities, is that when people are led to believe that one type of production practice is safer or more nutritious than another, it actually drives down total consumption of fruits, vegetables, and grains. So there can be a negative impact from not speaking to the facts of science and scientific consensus. Very good. I, I would add that Rodale Institute would be more than happy to supply additional data that showcases the opposite side of that conversation because science can show what people want it to show. But there are clear differences in nutritional quality of crops that are produced in soils that are farmed differently. Thank you. You can uh, submit those to the committee. So Dr. Larson, one more question. Can you elaborate on your uh, comment about the wholesale elimination of pesticides uh, will hurt, not help climate smart agendas. And you specifically referenced effects on food waste and food conversion. Can you make any additional comments about those uh, issues? Yeah, thank you so much for the question. 2020 was recognized by the UN as the year of plant health, and as a plant pathologist, uh, that made me very happy. 40% uh, of all food waste happens on farm before anything gets to the grocery store because there's poor pest and disease management. So access to pesticides to be able to control those pests and diseases on farm is critically important. And more and more farmers are engaged in integrated pest management that reduces those reliance on synthetic fertilizers and emerging breeding techniques like gene editing are gonna reduce reliance on pesticides even further, but be able to control the pests and diseases that are gonna be prevalent on farms. And one more question for you, Dr. Larson, if you will. Uh, in your testimony, you mentioned Western sugar farmers would not have been able to transition to no-till or conservation tillage without the use of glyphosate. Will you expand upon the role of glyphosate and then what it plays in uh, facilitating conservation practices in the farms? And why do some claim it is detrimental to soil health? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, for us, controlling broadleaf weeds, which are a prevalent weed species across the Ro Rocky Mountain West, is very difficult in a broadleaf crop. It's hard to kill something that's very similar in nature without dinging the crop as well. So it's critical. When we got glyphosate, it allowed farmers to have more uh, consistent and complete weed control. So they could put away their plows, they could put away their cultivation equipment and not have to disturb the ground anymore. They had chemical correction. And because of the sentiment that glyphosate is killing the soil 
soil microbiome, we actually have invested tens of thousands of dollars doing routine soil analysis across all of our farms to show that the depth and breadth and diversity in soil function has not been affected by the application of glyphosate. In fact, the diversity and activity of our soil microbiome is up sixfold, suggesting that tillage itself is far more detrimental to soil health and the soil microbiome than chemical applications. Thank you very much. And I see my time is almost over. I yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Baird. And now the gentlewoman from Maine, Ms. Pingree, is recognized for five minutes. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you so much for holding this hearing. It's a, it's a critically important topic as we go into work on the next Farm Bill, and uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for that. And uh, I want to thank all the witnesses. You've all really uh, given us a lot of interesting testimony from all points of view, but it all leads back to uh, an important understanding of how how critical soil health is to both uh, dealing with climate change and then the future of farming and success for our farmers. So, so thank you for that. Um, I am glad to hear about all of this because I think the more we can move conventional agriculture into regenerative practices, the better off we will all be and the better off our environment and our farmers will be. But I have a particular interest in organic farming, having been a certified organic farmer myself and involved in it for a very long time also a big fan of the Rodale Institute. So thank you so much, Mr. Moyer, for being with us today. Um, I know you've done some work there, uh, sort of a more of a big picture scale about conversion to organic agriculture and soil health and how much carbon can actually be sequestered out of the atmosphere. And since that's such a critical topic right now, what techniques do we use to sequester carbon? Can you talk a little bit more about the studies uh, that have been done there and sort of the quantification of how how much um, carbon we can sequester? Yes, thank you very much for the question and the conversation around carbon and carbon sequestration. We know that the way we manage soils can have a huge impact on its ability to sequester carbon. Um, many of our uh, practices that we employ, we already discussed about cover crops and we may have uh, discussed about crop rotations. These are all tools that farmers can implement to sequester carbon. It's becoming more and more critical. The amount of carbon we can sequester is certainly dependent upon the, uh, the relationship between the practices that we're superimposing on the landscape and the soil's innate ability through clay particles and the different uh, soil types to sequester carbon. What's equally important is that we sequester carbon at greater depths. Uh, as those of us who are being uh, pulled into the, the concepts around carbon marketing want to know that our carbon is not simply cycling. Uh, if you're aware of carbon, then you're aware of the word carbon cycle, which means it moves throughout the the environment, uh, it's, it's in the air, it's in the water, it's in the soil. And we want to be able to sequester carbon at greater depth so it's more permanently sequestered and not volatilized back into the atmosphere. So yes, our work at Rodale Institute is continually uh, exploring and expanding the concepts around carbon sequestration. And we have a tremendous amount of data that we'd be more than happy to share with this committee uh, and with you in particular. Uh, thanks so much. We'll, we'll look forward to exploring that more. And I do appreciate your mention of the deep roots, which was also one of the principles that, that Mr. Clark mentioned. Um, now I'm going to get a little more technical or, I guess, into the weeds, which is sort of a bad pun. But, you know, we're talking a little bit about the use of glyphosate and how um, how challenging it can be, particularly, I think, in organic farming, uh, to deal with weeds, to deal with uh, sort of ending the life of your cover crop and doing so with no-till. And so, um, if uh, maybe uh, Mr. McCarthy or uh, Clark, you both are practicing organic farmers on a big scale. Um, how do you deal with this challenge or how do you see us looking at that in the future and what more research or support needs to be out there uh, to avoid having to use herbicides in, in practices like we're talking about? Great, great question. Thank you for the question. Um, uh, what we have found is the basis for our weed suppression is the biomass that is generated by the cover crop. Then you mechanically terminate that cover crop with a roller crimper. You are creating a mat, a mulch, uh, a, a armor on the soil. And this armor does many, many things. And you can now look at uh, arid environments that, that make the claim we can't grow cover crops here. But 
once you armor the soil and eliminate or mitigate the evaporation that's taking place and, and you build that soil health, you're building the aggregate stability, you're building your water holding capacity so when it rains and, and your neighbor says, hey, I, I've got, I got an inch of rain, how much did you get? Your answer is, I got it all because it went into the ground. And That's now great. I might. I, I got to move to Mr. McCarthy, but I, I do appreciate that, and maybe I can follow up with you. and And thanks for reminding us that uh, uh, this topic is nonpartisan. So, Mr. McCarthy, what do you do as a technique? I, I thought the roller crimping is interesting. Yeah. So, one thing that I think is important to note is that uh, my farms are not organic farms. Uh, oh, we are non GMO. We are non GMO project verified, but we are not organic. But uh, the practices that we use to to mitigate the use of pesticides is varied. You know, we live in a very different climate than what uh, uh, what Rick lives in, and uh, we utilize cover crops. We've uh, we've explored different planting population densities and planting row widths to try to shade out those weeds faster. Uh, we're working on different varieties of cover crop programs that will help choke out pest weeds, especially those that are resistant to current uh, herbicide uh, chemicals. Uh, we're also looking at different crop rotations and exploring those types of crop rotations where we can break that weed cycle as opposed to a corn on corn on corn type of uh, uh, cropping cycle. All of those different methodologies uh, have been have shown some and varied levels of effectiveness at controlling weed populations across our farms. Unfortunately, the general okay, lady's time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I appreciate that. And now the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Fenstra, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman Scott and Ranking Member Thompson, uh, for holding this hearing today. Um, I, I want to start out by just giving a shout out to our producers. Uh, they do an amazing job. Uh, they are the breadbasket to the world. They are the literal ones that are producing the food. My district, Iowa 4th District, is either number one or two in the nation when it comes to corn and soybean production. Actually, my county, where I live, Sioux County, is number one uh, when it comes to corn and, and cattle and other things. So I take this very seriously. And I want to say this about our producers. All right? My in-laws are one of them. Is that we take soil health very seriously. Why do we take it seriously? Because when you have good soil health, you also create uh, more production. It goes hand in hand, literally goes hand in hand. So our farmers in the Midwest, in Iowa, are every day looking at better ways to create soil health from cover crops to no-till to rotations to terraces, uh, you name it. And I think about when I was a kid, you know, when, when, when we hear about, oh, if we can only get 125 a bushel of corn per acre you know, today, today, um, the farmer is looking at over 200, and if he doesn't get over 200, it's a disappointment. And frankly, in Sioux County, if we don't hit over 250, we're, we're, we're upset. Right? It's just amazing what's happening. But there's always research that is needed, and that's why I love my land-grant institution so much, Iowa State University, that does a tremendous job. And with that, uh, Dr. Larson, I'd like to ask... Iowa State's doing a lot of different research on hybrids, on, on soils and stuff like that. Where do you see more research needed from our land-grant institutions? Thank you for the question. Having worked in basic research at a university and USDA myself, I see a lot of value in what these third-party researchers do. To me, there are a lot of really interesting ideas that come out of academic research that lack the capability to be scaled. And so we need a way for universities to have better structure and scalability. I think that's first and foremost. And I think one thing that's not been mentioned on this panel is that all of these great practices that we've talked about today, soil scientists recognize they only have the capacity to offset current emissions. If everybody everywhere around the world that's farming did all of those practices, it would only sequester enough carbon to offset what we emit today, does nothing for the legacy load. So soil scientists are crying for frontier technologies like high carbon soil amendment, perennial grains that are gonna allow us to be able to start pulling down and actually draw down on that legacy load. And universities will play a big role in that. Yep, I, I agree 100%, uh, Dr. Larson. And thank you for those comments. And uh, I, I love the academic arena that is looking at different things. But we always have to remember that, uh, you know, 
my in-laws, uh, the, the producers out there, they want to do its best. They really do. Uh, but they also want to make a living. Uh, they want to add value. And, and, and we see this, and if you could talk about this, Dr. Larson. So, so, you know, we talk about academic. I was an academic. I was a professor. Um, how do we take it from academia to, to the real world? And I think about Iowa State Extension, by the way, it started in my hometown, uh, Hull, Iowa. Um, but how do we deploy these new strategies and, and, and get uh, uh, the farming community to add value to what they're already uh, seeing in production? We're big fans of private-public partnerships. So I'll give you a quick example from Nebraska. Western Sugar Farmers pulled dollars out of their pockets, funded a university scientist to see, can we improve nutrient stewardship? He demonstrated in 110 square feet that we can, but that's not enough to convince farmers that that's the option going forward. So we applied for a USDA SARE grant and got $75,000 that allowed us to test that on five large pivots to show our growers that even though we've increased yield 35%, we can cut back on fertilizer by 30. Yep. So that's an excellent example of yep. scale up from and, and academic you, to practical. And, and you nailed it, all right? If you can cut back fertilizer, that's an input cost mm -hmm. and, and a significant input cost, especially today, all right? And, and that helps added value. And I sometimes think that we're going at it the wrong way is how do we add value to the production? Because the far, that's all the farmer, they, they, wanna, they wanna have great soil, they absolutely do, but they also have to make a living and we are the breadbasket to the world, and we continually will be, all right? Everybody looks to us, all right? And, and, and I don't ever want anybody to think that, that we're the monsters in the room. We're not. I mean, our producers are the greatest people in this great country. And, and, and I just, I'm here to say, how can I help them? You know, how can we make a difference? I know, Dr. Larson, you think the same thing. So thank you with that. I yield back. Thank you. And now the gentlewoman from Iowa, Ms. Axney is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Scott. Um, thank you to my colleague from Iowa, uh, Representative Feenstra. He's absolutely right. We have the best stewards of the environment uh, in Iowa and uh, because we got a lot of farmers, and you all certainly know, uh, know all about that. Um, thanks for being here. This is a really important topic, and as you just heard Representative Feenstra uh, describe what we produce in Iowa, you know, we've got uh, the best soil uh, in the country, often described as black gold, uh, that we absolutely want to keep and that we are unfortunately uh, scared uh, that this runoff is going to continue, uh, that we'll continue to see less nutrients, and so we're doing everything we can to protect it. So today's a very important discussion. Thank you. Um, there's some serious con uh, concerns about the sustainability of our practices. It's been estimated that the Corn Belt has lost a third of our topsoil, and we're losing it 10 times faster than that of replenishment. And the studies estimate that soil loss in Iowa is worse than any other state, greatly endangering our state's biggest asset and the ability for future generations to farm uh, as their predecessors uh, had. But thankfully, there's a lot of tools that we can uh, utilize to help combat this problem. And studies are showing that farmers are utilizing those tools to combat that soil loss. Cover cropping, of course, for example, is a key regener regenerative approach uh, to help us rebuild our soil. And while there's a number of USDA programs that can be used to support cover cropping, I was particularly pleased to see the USDA roll out Pandemic Cover Crop Program, a $5 per acre incentive crop insurance to help farmers employ cover crops as a risk management tool. It's a bill I'm on, so I'm pretty, pretty, pretty supportive of it. Uh, you may know that in uh, 2021 in Iowa, this program incentivized over 850,000 acres of cover crops with over 4.2 million to Iowa farmers to incentivize soil health. And nationwide last year, almost $60 million for cover crops were distributed on over 12 million acres. So it's clearly successful and codifying it in the next farm bill will ensure farmers have long-term opportunity to ramp up the opportunity for cover crop adaptation. So uh, let's hopefully get my legislation, the Cover Act, uh, passed because it will ensure resilience uh, in the crop. I like that thumbs up from the crowd over there. Uh, insurance program uh, to strengthen this long-term success. So let me get to uh, a producer right here, Mr. Clark. Uh, obviously, we know you utilize uh, cover crops on all your acres. Can you elaborate on what you've seen with implementing cover crops and what has it done for your soil health, your yields, your input? Let's talk bottom line here. Yeah. Exactly. Um, well, so many times, uh, Representative Axney, um, a farmer's success is based on yield, and we are looking at how are we going to maximize our ROI per acre on, on everything that we, we have in the farming operation. So when you start to look at 
the journey that we were on, when we, when we were absolutely maximizing our efficiency on the farm, we were at 100% no-till, 100% cover crop, and a 60% reduction of inputs. So mm. we were still using some fertilizers, some chemistry, but at a greatly reduced rate. We had yields that were increasing year over year, and our stability within the system had gone from a yield variance of 30 bushels in corn to less than five. So that means that it's a stable environment. When you have a stable environment, you then are powerful because then you can react to market fluctuations. When, when something crazy happens and the markets spike and they take off, you have the ability and the comfort to safely sell into that anomaly because you have this stability now that's been created. And it's not just one year, two it, This is multiple years of seeing this stability. Thank you for the question. Well, and listen, thank you for that answer. If, I, if there's anything I know, certainty uh, for our farmers is the number one thing that they're looking for. I, I would like to say there, there's a county in Iowa, Washington County is a tremendous, I'm not sure whose district that would be in, tremendous county and that is a county that absolutely f they feed off of each other and they're just growing this this soil health regenerative movement is exploding in that county well that's that's good to know and I'll absolutely check into it so I want to follow up a bit here on this a need for more education on technical assistance which you've mentioned um, I want to really, because I hear from our farmers and they're talking about all the great soil testing and the data that they're getting from that and how they're using it. Do you think that's an area where we could be using more technical assistance in soil testing and interpretation of those oh, results? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, we, here's what we're doing at home in Indiana. Uh, every year we have a, a, a USDA NRCS training on our farm, so we are... are are talking to the leaders of the state within the USDA. They, they contact the DCs. The DCs are coming to our farm, and we are having a soil health day on our farm. And exactly, we're doing these, these principles. We're showing, the, like the slake test or a slump test. We're showing these things. They then, these DCs get to understand this because the DC is the first contact that farmer's gonna have. It is imperative that this group of individuals are properly trained so they know how to have a conversation about what is that guy down the road doing? He's the got general all lady's stuff. time has expired. Thank you. And Question. unfortunately, and now I recognize the general lady from Minnesota, Miss Fishback, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the opportunity. And, uh, you know, first, I, I just, uh, even though I'm from Minnesota and we don't often agree with people from Iowa, um, I just wanted to, uh, you know, join Mr. Feenstra in thanking the producers because I really, I think that is something that we don't always do um, and uh, really recognize them as a vital part of, of the country. And I strongly share his thoughts, you know, on, on the producers and their concerns and their care for the soil, um, soil health and, and that we really are, we are, should be here to help them. And uh, so I just, I wanted to uh, just reiterate uh, what Mr. Feenstra's Feenstra had had mentioned, and and then I just wanted to, uh, you know, Dr. Larson, I appreciate all of all of your thoughtful answers, and I've been listening uh, carefully. And uh, in your opinion, Dr. Larson, how do we correct the narrative that uh, American agriculture has killed our soils? And and I know that one of the other panelists actually had said that in their written testimony. And so I just wanted to see what your thoughts on um, how we how we stop that kind of uh, narrative that's going through the American. Yeah, I appreciate that question. It's, you know, as a scientist and looking at the scientific literature, doing direct physical measurement of the soil to show improvements is tough because the soil by itself is very heterogeneic. There's not much uniformity. So to be able to get concrete data and be able to measure very, very tiny changes in this very variable background in immediate time is tough. So we've pivoted to actually looking at the soil microbiome. So measuring the little microbes that are there, the fungi and the bacteria, to understand how our cultural practices impact that dynamic. Because all of those critters that are in the soil are responsible for ultimately building soil health, cycling nutrients and sequestering carbon. So I think that getting those tools affordable and in the hands 
hands of farmers is critical, and I am a strong believer in trying to create bioindicators. So instead of having to look at the entirety of the soil microbiome community, find some key indicator species that can reliably be used to predict, predict in real time what cultural practices are helping or hurting so that we can get that real-time measurement. And, and I appreciate that answer. And, and I would just say, I think that we also just need to really recognize and continue to, to talk about, like Mr. Feenster did, that, that the producers really are, that is their first concern is soil health. It is their, it is their livelihood. They need to make a living. And um, just concerned that this kind of narrative that, uh, that agriculture is ruining the, uh, ruining soil is a problem, but there are certainly things that we can do to help change that. And I appreciate it. And with that, Mr. Chair, I will yield back. Thank you. And now the gentlewoman from Washington, Ms. Schreier, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and welcome to all of our witnesses. I am loving this discussion. Uh, as this committee examines soil health practices with a farm bill on the horizon, uh, it's worth exploring existing USDA programs that aid growers looking to improve the health of their soils, as we have heard a lot about today. Uh, one of the lesser known programs, although I just heard a nod to it earlier, is SARE, the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Extension Program. Uh, SARE is a USDA research program that provides grants to farmers to focus research on their very specific needs and communicate their findings and best practices to their community. Uh, SARE has funded nearly 200 projects in Washington state alone, focusing on a broad range of topics, including soil additives, uh, tree fruit pests, and sustainable grazing practices. Uh, I'm currently working on a bill to modernize SARE to ensure that we're maximizing every tool at our disposal to improve ag research capacity and our ability to study novel regenerative practices that will improve soil health, and on-farm productivity. Um, Dr. Larson, I would love to get your input here. Uh, we know that problems like uh, uh, CSP are very popular and often oversubscribed, even in the neighborhood of like three to one in Washington state. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about SARE or other small dollar programs that have an outsized impact on soil health and associated climate and yield, as we just heard, uh, benefits. Yeah, so as an academic myself, I appreciate this question. There's so many cool things that happen in 110 square feet. And academics are very quick to say, hey, look what I did, now let's do that on every farm across America. It's not that simple. And I am a huge fan of SARE and promote it widely across all of the sugar beet cooperatives because it's a very useful tool to help bridge from that interesting academic idea to prove scalability. And we see it honestly as a stepping stone. So I mentioned we we're able to use a SARE grant to show our farmers that what happened in 110 square feet in this instance is going to work at large scale, that we can cut back fertilizer 30%, even though we've increased yield 35%. And it provides a foundation of data now for next week. Dr. Bajesh Marhajan at the University of Nebraska and Western Sugar are jointly submitting a SIG on-farm innovation trial grant with the data that we obtained from SARE, the learnings that we had from SARE about the hurdles for grower adoption, to be able to scale it up across 100 farmers in two states over five years. So SARE is a really important uh, pro program, and I'm so happy that you're expanding and supporting that program. I love that answer because especially now with scarcity of fertilizer and increased costs, the notion that you can cut inputs and increase yields is so important. Uh, I also wanted to highlight the Washington Soil Health Initiative. It's an innovative partnership between Washington State Department of Agriculture, Washington State University, and the Washington State Conservation Commission. And the initiative established a coordinated approach to soil health across the state. Uh, the initiative is currently doing a, a state of the soils assessment to track soil health over time uh, in region and different soil types and developing soil carbon verification metrics for the state's sustainable farms and field program that provides funding for farmers and ranchers 
to adopt climate smart practices. And we need the data to back those up. So this is a unique model that uses a multi-pronged approach to study uh, the scientific nuances while providing pathways for adoption and behavior change. This initiative requires tremendous coordination and I'm so proud to say that Washington State is leading the way. And as we look to the next Farm Bill, uh, the initiative's staff uh, highlighted for me and my staff that a national soil health effort would greatly benefit from similar coordination and collaboration between uh, agencies, universities to unify, unify and maximize the impact. Uh, so we need to make sure, for example, that we have adequate and diverse staffing like economists and sociologists, data scientists, uh, in addition to farmers to demonstrate the impacts of regenerative practices and organize national uh, and regional adoption efforts. So I look forward to working with my colleagues um, to provide federal investment in the SARE program and in these collaborative programs uh, to improve soil health across the board. And I yield back. Thank you for this discussion. Thank you, Ms. Schreier. And now the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Finstead, please, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first and foremost, I just want to say it's so great for me to be here. Uh, this is my first committee hearing as a new member to Congress, and it couldn't, uh, it couldn't be a better committee hearing to be, uh, to be at and a, a committee to be on. I'm a fourth-generation farmer from southern Minnesota. Uh, soil is important to us. Uh, it's something that we have passed on generation to generation, and the health of the soil is so important that my family actually uh, started and owns and operates a soil laboratory. So you can imagine I'm geeking out here today with all of you and the, uh, the interest that you have in soil health, um, so it's near and dear to me. When I look at uh, what we do in southern Minnesota, uh, you know, it is so it is so generationally driven that we care about our land because we know that that is what we have to pass on. And so I'm proud to say that my uh, senior in high school oldest son has taken an interest in farming, so the soil is pretty important to us in making sure that we're leaving it better for him uh, to farm in the next generation. But as I look at farming practices and uh, you know policy that we have the opportunity to discuss here, I, uh, I like looking at data and I like trying to understand the science behind the data and understanding the application with uh, the, the, implica the application and the implication of the policies that we do here. So Dr. Larson, uh, a 2017 survey found that more than 95% of Nebraska growers uh, have used, uses uh, herbicide to terminate cover crops. Uh, 2021 study found that about 80% of all U.S. growers use herbicides to terminate cover crops. And so presumably this is because herbicides are the most effective methods to do that. And uh, as a farmer and as someone that has seen the, uh, the pros and cons and the effects of using herbicides and using them at the right rate at the right time to uh, control uh, cropping decisions, I, uh, my question, Dr. Larson, is would you agree that herbicides are an important tool for growers to have available uh, at our fingertips to improve cover crop adoption in the United States? Absolutely 100%, and I appreciate that question. Um, if we lose those tools, it's gonna to be a major step backwards in terms of conventional agriculture that dominates a majority of the farming acres. If we take those away, mechanical removal is the next best option, and that's gonna disturb the soil. It's gonna release the carbon that was captured in the soil back into the atmosphere, and it's gonna destroy the soil micro down, my, microbiome down beneath the soil. Thank you, Dr. Larson. And, uh, you know, for me, this issue is or the, the discussion of herbicides and the use of herbicides and, and the when and the where and the how uh, is, is just a real and alive issue for me, someone that grew up walking beans in southern Minnesota. Um, there was definitely great value in that work ethic and that family bonding that happened during that process. But there's also the efficiencies gain and the yields that we're able to uh, see the increase uh, based on the timely use of herbicide and the, and the right use of herbicides. And I will say that as we as farmers are asked to feed a growing global uh, world, it's so important for us to have that balance and, and maybe not a one size fits all, uh, all or nothing approach. So I appreci appreciate uh, uh, your willingness to be here today and your uh, adding to this conversation and all of you for the work that you're doing, again, to preserve the soil and that, you know, that greatest asset that we have to pass on to our next generation. So thank you all. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And now the gentleman from California, Mr. Panetta, is recognized for five minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to our witnesses and Mr. Finstead. Welcome. Look forward to working with you. It's good to hear. Thank you. Um, I come from the central coast of California. Obviously, we got a lot of specialty crops there, uh, as you know it. And as I like to say, uh, you name it, we grow it. Uh, and I, but despite that, I feel that my producers uh, in my district are doing a lot when it comes to paving the way for climate smart, soil smart farming practices. To that end, I want to address a bill that Representative Baird from Indiana and myself have put forward, H.R. 7752, the Plant Biostimulant Act. As some of you may be aware, plant biostimulants are an emerging and rapidly growing ag input that have the ability to improve and enhance our soil health. The plant biostimulant category covers a diverse set of technologies, but most of the products are derived from naturally occurring materials or microbes that were discovered to be beneficial to the soil or plant health or even both. Now, similar to how probiotics are good for us, plant biostimulants can increase diversity of the soil micro microbiome fix nitrogen in the soil, make nutrients more available to the plants, and improve soil structure that increase water holding capacity or organic content. The bill that we introduced would create a federal definition for plant biostimulants, which is a term that has not yet been defined at the federal level. It would also amend and clarify two other related definitions and authorize USDA to perform a soil health study on plant biostimulants so that we can fully understand and advance the contributions to better our soil health. Uh, that's why I do believe that H.R. 7752 is an important bill. Now, Mr. Clark or Mr. McCarty, that's uh, virtual, um, have you heard of the term plant biostimulant? Oh, yeah. Yes. I'm glad you brought this up. Great. This is right where I want to be. In what way? Um, I, I, I'm not a biologist. But I do know that there is a living, breathing microbiome below our feet. And I feel like through our journey, um, I was very stubborn in not pursuing these avenues of bringing these stimulants to the, to the farm. Because this is going to speed up the soil health building process. Okay, so my stubbornness has probably delayed our seeing this by a few years, but I think if a person is in a high tillage environment and they want to transition to regenerative practices, this is what you add as an augmentation to your system. And it is a system. This a microbial package has is, is got to be a system just like anything else is. Yeah. Now, Mr. Clark, what, what do you think we in Congress or this committee could be doing better to ensure uh, further education around plant biostimulants or other innovative soil health technologies I, and practices? I think, I think there needs to be, um, uh, academia needs to have uh, 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 students that are gonna go out and we need to identify uh, more of this microbial biome and, and then what do certain sectors do? For example, I think what we're, where we're gonna head one day is we are going to sit down and we're going to say, okay, what are your three biggest weed problems? What is your next cash crop going to be? And now this is the cocktail package we're going to put together and augment it with the stimulant package because it's going to create an environment that water hemp, for example, is not going to want to germinate and grow in. That is where this needs to go. Great. And that starts with the passing of the Plant Biostimulant Act, right? Yeah. Of course. Great. Exactly. Thanks Thank for, you. Just thanks for bringing this Just up. Just checking. Uh, Mr. Moyer, let me pivot to you. Your testimony describes regenerative organic. Um, in my district, uh, look, we get it when it comes to the value of organic and the reason why consumers trust that label. Now, I met with, the, with a group yesterday that referenced how regenerative could mean six or seven different things when it comes to agriculture. Um, you know, to me, that seems to complicate things for our longstanding organic producers that have relied on the National Organic Program for years to market and certify their products. Can you discuss, Mr. Moyer, whether there is a need to formalize that definition at the federal level, at the USDA, and what the lack of standards or consistent definitions might mean for producers on both sides of the conversation? Yeah, uh, complicated question. Thank you very much for it. Uh, I do not think that we need a national standard at this point in time. We have uh, great partnerships with industry, 
and nonprofits and the federal government currently. So we do have a standard out there for regenerative organic that is uh, being uh, rolled out across the, the, the world. And we're seeing great success in that, that partnership between the federal government, nonprofits, and uh, the food industry, giving people the opportunity to have great input and impact into how Thank they define it. Thank you, Mr. Moyer. I'm yeah. out of time. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Absolutely. Thank you. And now the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Bacon. Thank you, Mr. It's Chairman. recognized five minutes. And it's great to have a Nebraska panelist with us as well. So uh, welcome. In fact, I, I, my first question is for you, Ms. Larson, if I may. I've read this. I want you to just give me your comments if it's true or not or your insights. You know, people say organic food is produced without the use of pesticides, uh, but that's not really the case. While organic production cannot use synthetic pesticides, you can still use organic pesticides. Because these organic pesticides are generally less effective, they tend to be used more intensively, and organic producers often have to apply them multiple times throughout the growing season. Uh, Dr. Larson, can you uh, talk more about how organic herbicides are not always better for, for soil health? And just give us your insights. Yeah, so organic farmers do have the capability to use um, non-synthetic uh, herbicides, so oftentimes they'll result to things like acids. Acetic acid is a common one to terminate cover crops. Um, but they primarily rely on tillage in order to destroy cover crops and manage weeds. And even in the um, no-till organic system that, uh, if you look at the Rodale Institute's website, indicates they still have to plow every other year. And so if you have taken the time to sequester all that carbon into your soil and then you reintroduce a plow, whether it's every year or every other year, that carbon storage is not permanent, it's reversible. And so when they go through with that plow, they're releasing all of that carbon that they've stored and worked so hard for back into the environment. But yeah, so tillage is the primary thing that they rely on, but yes, it, many people think that there are no chemicals in organic, but there are, they're just natural and usually less effective. I would like to correct one statement, having uh, being at Rodale Institute. If you, if you look at the data that we put out there, and I, I would encourage you to uh, look at the, the facts, that we do not till every other year. Uh, that's, that's not the system that we're employing. So tillage is not the enemy, depending on how and where you do it, and I think we can mitigate many of those problems. But you do use organic herbicides or pesticides, right? I'm sorry. You're... But you do use organic, um, just to make sure I get my right terms on here. Inputs. We use organic inputs. Okay. I'm, so the, I'm sorry, the, the I'm, question the question was. Um, okay. That, I can find my right Thank question you. here. Go back to this one. Hmm. You're still using organic pesticides. Yes, so am, am I correct? We we do not. Okay. So, I will, rec I will recognize the fact that I did cite the Rodale Institute's website directly, and it's within my written comments that says that with organic no-till, you have to plow every other year. I don't implement it. I don't know much about it, but that was just pulled from Rodale Institute's website. Okay. Uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I'll yield back. Yield back. Thank you. Thank you. And now the gentlewoman from North Carolina. Ms. Adams, who is also the vice chair of the Committee on Agriculture, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, thank you so much also to the ranking member uh, for today's hearing on soil health and, and to our witnesses, thank you for your testimony. Uh, soil is the source of our lives and it is responsible for life on earth. So listening to our witnesses today uh, describe a broken food system and, and, and sound the alarm, the alarm is going off, <laughs> the alarm to increasing soil uh, de degradation uh, leads me to knowledge that uh, regenerative, regenerative agriculture is part of the solution to this crisis. It's also proven to be a profitable way to farm, but Yet only 1% of American farmland is certified organic and, and, and farmed regeneratively. So it's time for a massive shift to save our um, agri-system. Um, Mr. Clark, uh, the importance of conservation opportunities has been cited throughout this panel. Uh, farmers can sign up for climate-friendly bundles under the con conservation stewardship program, but not many do. Uh, what incentives can we provide to farmers to increase their participation in CSP? Right. That's a great question. I, I think it goes back to the teaching again. Uh, I think, unfortunately, 
there may be just plain and simply the farmer does not have faith in that, that individual to guide them in the right direction. Uh, for example, I mentioned earlier in testimony that we have teachings at our farm through uh, USDA and RCS. We were very fortunate to have a, a very great group of young DCs. Every one of these DCs did not have any agricultural background. So it's imperative that the proper teaching is given to these folks so that they then can properly implement these great programs like CSP, EQIP, uh, no-till programs and such. So thank you for the question, Representative Adams. Okay, educate, education is the key. So um, Mr. Um, in Igren, uh, in my home state of North Carolina, millions of hogs and chickens are being raised in large factory farms. Uh, these operations are, are clustered within communities of color and many have faced environmental and health impacts. So how can more regenerative agriculture help strengthen the economies of rural communities in North Carolina? Well, if you look at a lot of our family farms, we realize that we've lost a lot of our small family farms. Uh, they're the ones that really support the agrarian economy, the local merchants. And if we bring small farms back into our rural communities across the United States, we'll not only have a local food system that doesn't depend on uh, the, the uh, fossil fuels to get it to the shelf, uh, but you can, it can go directly from the farms uh, to the consumer, but it will really stimulate the local economy, which will totally change our small towns across America. Okay, thank you. So um, let me ask Mr. Clark um, about regenerative practices uh, that, that you've undertaken. You mentioned that the transition to, to some can take years, years while incentives are sometimes only focused on, on the short term. So how were you able to successfully bridge that gap? Yeah, that, uh, that's a great question. Um, it takes courage. Um, you have to be uh, uh, faithful and, and understand that you're starting to work with Mother Nature and we need to figure out how the best ways are to accommodate uh, working with some, this microbial biome. I mean, this, this was just, you know, 15 years ago. I knew nothing about this. It was, it's been there for a long time. I knew nothing about it. Um, I'm not a biologist. I'm not an expert in this area. I do know that that, that biology exists. I've seen it. I have a, a microscope myself. I can get it out. I can look at things. I don't know what they're all called, but I can see the change. I can see the numbers are different. So it's very, very important that you, 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 you surround yourself with positive people that give you reinforcement. This is very important. Negativity brings everybody down. So positive reinforcement, and everyone is on the journey, the ride of the journey. And that's what this is. You're trying to figure out how to work and grow with Mother Nature and build soil health. And what Thank we haven't you, talked I'm, much I'm about today of, is human health. Thank you. Human health is very so important much. also. Thank you, sir. I'm out of time. Mr. Thank you. you. And uh, thank you, Chair, uh, <clears throat> Chair Lady. And now the General Lady from Florida, Ms. Kamek. Is now recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the conversation today regarding soil health, uh, representing a state that produces over 300 specialty crops and uh, is a major contributor to our nation and the world's agriculture. Uh, this is a very important topic. Uh, I'm going to focus in on a couple of key issues, but this first question goes to all of our panelists. We can start going down the line. Uh, first and foremost, thank you for being here today, uh, both to, as I said, the chairman and the ranker. But I want to start out with a discussion about biochar in agricultural production and its application. In Florida, the use of biochar derived from wood products or waste is viewed as a positive new advancement for soil health in agricultural production. For example, there are a number of nurseries, citrus groves, and others who have incorporated the use of biochar into their operations. Now, according to the University of Florida's Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, IFAS, 
Biochar can have benefits for waste production, energy production, carbon sequestration, and soil fertility without sacrificing any production tools needed. Now, moreover, UFIFIS notes that biochar can positively and simultaneously improve crop yields and reduce fertilizer requirements for crops in certain environments. And we're gonna continue to push for additional studies on this issue, but would any one of our witnesses be able to speak to the potential benefits for both producers and soil health by increasing the use of biochar in certain production areas throughout the United States? I would like to speak to that question if that's okay. Uh, we actually got a grant, yes, or just this morning from the Partnerships for Climate Smart Commodities that's focused on this exact principle, high carbon soil amendment with biochar. This is imp um, imp imperative in terms of trying to address our soil health challenges. As I mentioned, all the stuff that we've talked about today that's currently recognized in conservation practice standards by NRCS is not enough to do more than just offset current emissions. We need frontier technologies such as biochar and high carbon soil amendment to help repair some of the damage from the fat of past and be able to take care of some of that legacy load of carbon within the atmosphere. And this is an excellent opportunity. We're actually recycling a waste stream from our factory to implement this high carbon soil amendment. But the overarching goal of our project is to be able to build in best management practices to this brand new interim conservation practice standard 808 as the biochar infrastructure is developing across the nation. This is a great way to to take material that could just sit and rot and cause emissions into the atmosphere and turn it into a high carbon stable form of carbon that can be injected directly into the, the soil. This is gonna be a game changer in terms of replacing uh, compost. It's gonna be a game changer for dealing with food waste. It's an excellent opportunity for everybody going forward. Wonderful, thank you so much for that. Uh, I'm not an expert uh, in biochar. I don't claim to be. Um, mm -hmm. But what I would like to say is that when you implement the principles of soil health, you increase your, your, your biomass that you're producing from your cover crops, you are feeding this microbial biome, I'm not sure that in that instance biochar is going to benefit me as much as I, I can benefit with mechanically terminating cover crops that will feed this microbial biome. But again, I'm not an expert. I appreciate your insight, Mr. Clark. I, I, I would agree with you, Rick. I think it depends where you are in the spectrum of transition and how the quality uh, and the health, the current health of your, of your soil. What we've noticed is that soils that are, are highly degraded, the, the uh, input of biochar makes a big difference. Uh, same with those biostimulants that we talked about earlier. And as you progress in your, in your journey towards a healthier soil, you see less and less impact or measurable impact from that, that biochar. But there's certainly an opportunity there to have uh, great success by using these new tools. I would add to that as well that uh, in particular in, in where I live in the country in Northwest Kansas, in particular in years such as the one we're going through today under extreme drought conditions, uh, cover crops might not be an issue. Frankly, they're not an issue or a, an option right now for most dry land farmers. But having uh, the tool of biochar available in the toolbox allows for uh, continued improvements in soil health, uh, carbon sequestration in years uh, when I implementing cover crop programs are not a viable option, such as this year. That's wonderful. And my time is about to expire. I have a follow-up question uh, that I'll submit for the record. If we could get a response, I sure would appreciate it. And thank you all for appearing before the committee today. Uh, today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. And now the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Bishop is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and let me thank you and uh, Ranking Member Thompson for hosting this hearing. It's very, very timely, and I want to thank our witnesses, and a special shout out to Mr. Nigren, who's from Georgia. Uh, and I'd like to address this question to Mr. Nigren. Uh, I was very pleased uh, to see you mention Mr. Will Harris in your testimony. Uh, as you know, I represent the second district in Georgia where Mr. Harris lives and where he operates white oak pastures. Uh, he's been recognized throughout our state, the nation, and even globally for his impeccable stewardship and commitment to regenerative agriculture. 
Uh, Mr. Cedric Rowe also referenced in your written statement is another constituent of uh, Georgia's second district. And many of the practices that he implements on his farm demonstrate benefits for both soil health and mitigating climate change. So I've got several questions to follow up on your written testimony. You mentioned the efforts to build the organic peanut sector in Georgia and how organics can be more profitable. Can you tell us what makes organic farming more profitable and how does the transition to organic farming affect the bottom line costs of production? Second question, that you stated that uh, industrial uh, agriculture damaged the local agra agrarian economy. Uh, do you believe that the ultimate goal is to replace industrial farming with local regenerative farms? And if so, will the production of farms from uh, of food from these farms be sufficient to feed the growing population uh, in the U.S. and across the world? Or do you think the number of regenerative farms should be increased to build a more resilient supply? And finally, uh, you, in your testimony, discussed the threat that's posed by development of agricultural land. And you mentioned the loss of jobs and farm uh, output. Uh, how can existing programs help and are easement programs a viable way to keep land in production? Those are three questions. I hope you caught them. Is that question to me or Mr. Moyer? It's to Mr. Nigren, I think. Yes, uh, I, I can answer the economic piece, but I would yield to uh, Mr. Moyer to talk about the science. Very uh, good, very good. Yeah, but if, if you look at Will Harris in your own district, uh, I think you would admit that the, the, the local merchants and the local economy, uh, there was a lot of vacant housing. Uh, that existed uh, a couple de decades ago. Absolutely. And it was when he changed his farm practices, uh, and I don't know the science, I just know the economics of it, uh, that totally changed the economy for the entire county. Uh, I believe you now have a housing sh shortage. Uh, the, uh, you have a, a complete uh, employment base that's being attracted to your county, uh, that uh, did not exist before uh, Will Harris changed his practices uh, on Absolutely. farming. Uh, Absolutely. I'll yield to, uh, if possible, to Mr. Moyer to talk about the science of that. Okay. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the question was about the science or the economics. I mean, there's really a, a great difference in the economics of organic agriculture because what we're seeing is a marketplace that's supporting farmers at the point of purchase for the true cost of producing that food. So many organic farmers, uh, depending on their scale, uh, do not necessarily uh, make, avail themselves to uh, government subsidy programs. They're making money uh, by selling the product at, at a uh, point of purchase for the value that it takes to produce that crop. And that's really been able to change the, uh, the economic picture of many farms across the country. The, uh, question, the other question I really would like to follow up on was uh, do, and any panelists can chime in on this, you believe that the ultimate goal is to replace industrial farming with local regenerative farms? And if so, will the regenerative farms be sufficient to feed the, uh, the growing U.S. population? Uh, and uh, or do you think the number of regenerative farms should be increased uh, so we have a more resilient supply chain? A okay. meta-analysis that was recently completed shows that organic agriculture at scale lags behind conventional farming to a point of 20%. And if they were able to implement best management practices, that yield gap may increase up to 34% compared to conventional farming, and I'll provide those citations. The other issue that you face is you can reduce uh, or you can increase that, uh, decrease that yield gap between conventional and organic and at optimum scientists predict that you could get between an 8 to 9 percent yield drag, which as Mr. Moyer indicated in his testimony, a 10 percent loss in yield due to soil health degradation would be devastating for climate mm -hmm. change because it would require millions of acres to be converted and there's nothing more detrimental to the protection of climate change and biodiversity than land use change. The gentleman's time has expired, and now I recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Allen, for five minutes. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to our uh, panel for your expertise. Uh, obviously, innovation is important uh, to this nation. Um, however, um, you know, we've been in our districts for the last month, and I have gotten an earful 
uh, from uh, p uh, the, the, the people, my constituents, are, are sick and tired of uh, this government perpetrating its will on them on what to drive, you know, what's morally right and wrong, and, and it's one issue after the other. And say, so, well, it's just, you know, these are, I don't care if the policies are terrible, uh, this is just the way it's going to be. And, uh, you know, I'm afraid we're caught up in, in another one of those things here where we're talking about changing the way we feed this country. And obviously uh, the importance, uh, it, it's a national security issue. And, you know, the best example that, that, that I have is uh, Sri Lanka. I mean, that government uh, perpetrated on its farmers uh, banning the use of synthetic fertilizers and pesticides. We're already having issues with that on our farms today, and it's going to affect yields this year. I mean, what the EPA is trying to do to them. The result of this was catastrophic. Yields for rice fell by 20% within the first six months of the policy, driving up food prices and forcing the largely self-sufficient country to import substantial quantities of rice to feed its people. We, we can't have this in this country. Uh, plus the fact that, uh, you know, what our farmers have been able to achieve in yields and other things has, has really allowed us to participate in feeding the whole world. The whole world is using us as an example of the freedom to innovate and to produce yields and to use the products available to us to do that. And there are no better conservationists than our farmers. Uh, this land has been in most of it they're in, in their families for generations. They have to protect the land and we have to assist them with that, but we don't need these one size fits all government policies that are creating havoc in the marketplace out there. Uh, Dr. Larson, um, you talked about the wholesale elimination of uh, pesticides and how that's going to affect uh, what, what we're dealing with here. Uh, you specifically referenced effects on food waste and land com com uh, com com uh, conversion. Uh, any way to predict what's going to happen? <laughs> if, if this is, you know, like I said, we don't want to be another Sh Sri Lanka. Why don't I give you a personal example of when mandates have gone wrong in my own life? So I live in Boulder County, Colorado. The county commissioners passed a ban on all GMOs and pesticide usage on Boulder County open space that encompassed a lot of our sugar beet acreage because they had some folks come in and promise them that no-till organic was possible and would have better environmental and economic outcomes for our farmers. Well, 10 years later almost, and millions of dollars spent trying to scale that up, there's not a single organic or conventional farmer that has switched to that within our geography because it's been too difficult to amass enough biomass with a spring-planted cover crop. So they've reverted back to what the farmers had done and come to their conclusions on their own to promote soil health because the science never added up and the economics never added up. Uh, and with that, uh, with that objection, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to submit an article for the record titled, In Sri Lanka, Organic Farming Went Catastrophically Wrong. This article was published on March 5th, 2022 in Foreign Policy and, and dives further into Sri Lanka's organic crisis. Without objection, Mr. Allen. Thank you very much. Dr. Larson, others on the panel, and we've got about 50 seconds here, uh, claim organically produced food is more nutritious because the soil in their system is healthier. What does the science say on this matter? As I mentioned, I'll provide some scientific literature because I think what's important is to look at the peer-reviewed literature in terms of scientific consensus on this matter. And there isn't any evidence that the food produced through organic farming methods is more nutritious, safer, or healthier for people to consume. And in fact, promoting that misconception that does not agree with scientific consensus is causing Americans, especially low-income and marginalized communities, to purchase and consume fewer fruits, vegetables, and grains that was found from an Oxford University study. Yeah. And for the record, uh, Mr. Chairman, I grew up on raw milk. And I'm still here. So, uh, so anyway, uh, uh, with that, I yield back. Yes, sir. <laughs> I did, too. <laughs> and you're still here. <laughs> right from the cow. Yeah. <laughs> On my grandfather's farm where I grew up. 
on my dad's farm. There you go. All right. And now the gentlewoman from the U.S. Virgin Islands, <clears throat> Miss Plaskin, who is also the chair of the subcommittee on biotechnology, horticulture, and research for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much for holding this, convening this hearing, and for the members who have <clears> offered <throat> their questions. And this has really been very informative. I'm really appreciative. I have a question for Mr. Moyer. Uh, in your written testimony, sir, it includes three priorities. Funding for, for cover crop utilization, to additional funding for USDA organic transition initiatives, and three, strategic planning to better serve farmers adopting regenerative organic models. Why are these three the most important priorities for Rodale? And to what extent can existing programs achieve these goals? Well, thank you very much for the, for the question and, the, and the opening up the conversation around uh, support mechanisms for farmers wishing to make that transition. We've heard throughout the testimony today that education is clearly important to farmers. Anytime a farmer is making a transition, and we're not suggesting we get away with it, uh, do away with industrial agri agriculture, we're suggesting we transition agriculture from one mode of production to something that is more focused on soil health. In order to make that transition, farmers, whether, no matter what the transition is, people need help and guidance, support, education, uh, consulting, and we want to make those dollars at the federal level available for farmers who choose, not who are mandated, but who, are, who choose to make a difference in their farming operation, whether in whole or in part, by acre or by crop. Uh, the USDA program allows for multiple uh, uh, implementation strategies, uh, but farmers need that guidance and support in order to make that change. They need to know that they're not alone in making that transition and that there are support mechanisms in place. Thank you. You know, in my uh, district of the Virgin Islands, our farmers are operating in very small farms, and so they need to really be conscious of soil health because to be able to pass it throughout generations, this is an important component. So as you said, this is not mandated, this is a choice. And I think it's important for U.S. data to provide the support. And so I'm grateful to you for uh, sharing with us those priorities and how that's done. Mr. Nygren, your written testimony refers to soil health as the platform to bring our small towns back to life. You mentioned that you believe value-added prog production will follow healthy soil. Do you believe that these are areas where soil health should be targeted? Uh, and how do we do that? One of the important things in the entire discussion is that we're not suggesting one or the other. Uh, I, I think this is talking about giving the small farmers, the farmers that are willing to uh, address the science, uh, an equal chance. Uh, right. And that uh, has not happened with a lot of the policy and the funds uh, that come out of the past farm bills. And that is one thing that you can change uh, in this farm bill to give them simply an equal chance with the industrial farms. Thank you. And I'm so glad that both of the witnesses are pointing this out, that what we are giving individuals are choices, particularly for small farmers. I know that often um, in testimony that I've heard, it plays well um, to say that these are absolutes and that the Democrats are forcing you to do something uh, that you know creates a good sound, um, uh, clip but that's not what we're talking about here in the Farm Bill. What we're talking about is giving those who are interested the opportunity to do that. And I think that that is what we, as all members, used to be interested in doing. Uh, Mr. Clark, thank you as well for your testimony and for your measured responses. I'm really very appreciative of that. Your testimony mentions the need to build local and regional processing infrastructure. In the Virgin Islands, we're very interested in how do we bring value added? How do we do that um, processing infrastructure? How does that impact soil health um, in that? Yeah, it's very important that uh, the, the, one of the principles of soil health is integrating livestock. And then you have to be able to have an outlet for those livestock to go to. So it's very important 
that we have processing facilities for small operations, medium-sized operations, and the larger operations. Um, I see this as a benefit to building soil health because integrating livestock, we do it on our farm. Uh, if you want to increase soil health the quickest and the most efficient way, you need to have livestock on your property and you need to follow the proper rotational grazing rules. Thank gotcha. you. Thank you so much again uh, to the chairman and I yield back. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and now, ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of this outstanding, informative, and historic hearing. I want to thank each of you. Mr. Jeff Moyer, CEO of Rodell Institute, Cutstown, Pennsylvania, thank you. My good friend, Mr. Steve Nigren of Georgia, founder and CEO of Serenby, Chattahoochee Hills, Georgia, and my constituent. Thank you for your leadership over the years. You pioneered this area years ago, and you stuck to it. I followed your career closely through the years jointly with mine as you have. Mr. Ken McCarty, partner of the McCarty Family Farms in Colby, Kansas. I can't thank you enough for dramatizing and hitting the critical nature, the crisis that we face for the future <clears throat> of our food supply. Thank you. And to Dr. Rebecca Larson, PhD, Vice President, Chief Scientist and Government Affairs, Western Sugar Cooperative of Denver. Excellent, all of you. Thank you. And we also had, um, did I miss? Oh, Rick Clark. There he is. Rick, I can't thank you enough. Uh, you sound the alarm. Paul Revere will be very proud of you. As I said, the British might not be coming, but a food shortage, our crisis is coming if we fail to act. And so I want to thank you, Rick. Owner, Farm Green and Clark Land and Cattle of Williamsport, Tennessee. I can't thank you enough, and it is so important that we cl clearly point out how important our soil is. It is the earth. The good Lord created us from there. As he scooped down to the earth, we come from there. We are a part of it. And so I just want to thank you because we call it Mother Earth for a reason. It is the origination of us, our food, our existence, and we've got to take care of it. And you all have helped us here. The nation is grateful. I think we've opened the light and showed that we are moving ahead. And this was why it was important for this committee to do it. And I want to thank you. And you heard from both the Republicans and Democrats who shared their feelings, individual, of our sincere appreciation and their top-of-the-line interests to make sure that we never have a food shortage. In order to do that, we've got to take care of our soil that produces our food and our survival. So I can't thank you enough. And uh, <clears throat> I just want to say God bless you. 
and Mr. thank Chair. you. And oh, I see. Who seeks a recognition? Mr. Baird. Baird. Congressman Baird from Indiana. Oh yes, Mr. Baird. Go right I ahead. Just want, I just wanted to add to what you've said uh, and welcome and express my appreciation for Mr. Clark from my district uh, being here and being on the panel. So thank you for letting me do that. Hey man, and I say to you, thank you for having Mr. Clark. It was an honor to be here, thank you. As I said, I don't know if you were here, but I said Paul Revere would be proud of him. He sounded the alarm for us to get ready and we're going forward with this. So, <clears throat> under the rules of the committee, the record of today's hearing will remain open <clears throat> for 10 calendar days to receive additional material and supplementary written responses from the witnesses to any question posed by a member. And with that, this hearing of the Agriculture Committee of the House of Representatives in Congress is adjourned.